What we want to do today is start with going backwards so that we can then talk about what's been taking place since then, some really nice, interesting, creative ideas that are going on in different places, ideas for you to take home and replicate, ideas we can be building off of. And I want to put in a word for what the purpose of today's forum is about. Today's forum is about moving forward. We want to identify good ideas that work. We all know the frustrations. It doesn't matter whether you're the resource agency, the regulator, the homeowner, the applicant. You've all been there. You all have the scars when it comes to permitting. Today's about moving forward, so I want to make sure everybody has that frame of reference, both in presentations and in questions. How can we move the dialogue forward? Okay? So, I want to first ask Joe. Joe Burkhardt is going to be our first speaker today. And Joe is with the, he's a senior shoreline park planner with the Department of Ecology. And he's in, um, oh, let me make it one stop. I'm going to ask Joe, you can take a break and wait a second. And I'm going to actually have an introdu introduction here. Uh, I want to actually introduce first, I'm going to make him take his coat off and run up front real quick. I want to introduce Dave Summers, who really is going to set the tone for today. Come on up, Dave. And Dave is in his fourth term as a member of the Snohomish County Council and represents the Southeast Snohomish County and he currently serves as the council chair and this is his 13th year as the council as the chairman. And he serves on the state shorelines hearings board and is a member of, he is the chair of the Puget Sound Partnerships Ecosystem Coordination Board. And with that, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Dale Carnegie said, when dealing with people, remember you are not dealing with creatures of logic, but creatures of emotion. And that's really, really true. And as a scientist, uh, biologist, I tend to go to trying to explain things, like uh, this bluff is feeding this pocket beach, it's very important. And for most landowners, most of the politicians I deal with, that means absolutely nothing. And, and it's, Try as hard as I may, and there's been we've done, made a lot of great attempts at educating the public with facts: slope stabilization, erosion control, vegetation, surface water, groundwater, coastal bluffs, vegetation management. A guy who can some property owners, great materials. Uh, but for many of the folks we deal with, the public and the individual. 
property owners, they're concerned about their property. They're concerned somebody's told them that if you don't fix this problem, uh, you're going to lose your property. And so it's an emotional issue. So how do, how do we bring the emotion of the Puget Sound or our shoreline or what's happening to our natural ecosystems? How do we create that story and transmit that? So that's what I, I'm struggling with at the moment. Those are the few ideas I have to toss out to you today to think about. I know there's a lot of other great ideas, a lot of things that people are doing. You're going to hear about those today uh, and be able to share amongst each other uh, what you're doing individually. And I just want to thank each and every one of you for what you do every day. It's your tough work and it's challenging times, but uh, thank you so much. Enjoy the day. Sorry it was late and Nicole, I hope I didn't run past my time. <laughs> Joe's turn. So Joe is a senior planner with the Department of Ecology and he's been involved in all aspects of shoreline master program updates and also was involved in the 2009 uh, efforts of the Green Shorelines. So I'm going to let you take it away. Well, good, good morning. Um, appreciate the introduction. I was um, late Friday afternoon uh, running around trying to think about how I was going to prepare my presentation. I knew I wasn't going to be able to get to it that day. Uh, ended up doing it last night, but um, uh, thinking back to 2009 and trying to think about what were the relevant parts of this, and I, I heard this interview on the radio from um, the late Pete Seeger, and he was talking about, um, I only heard part of the interview, but he was talking about how um, he was optimistic about the human race and in general because of the little things that people do to make a difference, and it's the big things can be really frustrating, um, and, and to be really challenging, but it's the little things. It's like helping your neighbor. It's like getting a community group together to start a library. Make a difference over And I think it's a, that's a really good metaphor for um, a lot of what was done uh, in the Lake Washington area where there were a lot of small efforts that were done to help, um, that, were, that were aligned in a way that, um, that helped um, get at some of these challenging bigger issues like shoreline stabilization um, and and um, it's and I think it's a good message just for looking at regulatory efficiency in general that it can be a very challenging thing to take on uh, front and center it's a very big scary topic because focusing on some of the small achievements will hopefully make it a little bit more manageable um, so the next slide so just to give you a little bit of context on the area for those that aren't familiar with uh, the Lake Washington uh, and Lake Sumatra, the issue that we were dealing with was um, how do we promote the replacement of hard structures, or hard shoreline stabilization structures with softer green shoreline uh, 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 types of stabilization along Lake Washington and Lake Sumatra, which is almost, I think, close to 70% of Vulcan. Uh, there's a lot, of, it's a small, relatively small geographic area, but there's a large number of stakeholders, a large number of interests uh, surrounding this topic. With federal agencies, state agencies, 17 different local jurisdictions that share jurisdiction along Lake Washington, Lake Sammamish, uh, nonprofit organizations, citizen, active citizen groups, community groups, um, consultants and contractors. Next slide. So I think one of the most important things about uh, the 2009 workshops is the amount of information, the foundational information that was available that set, uh, provided a lot of the recommendations and provided a lot of the background information and direction um, for both the formation of the Green Shorelines Committee but also the workshops that we did in 2009. So, one of the first efforts was, was the Chinook Salmon Recovery Plan uh, that laid out recommendations for how to um, re recover the population within Lake Washington, Lake Sammamish. There were a number of um, uh, past workshops that were done by different organizations, whether it was Seattle um, Public Utilities or uh, other local jurisdictions. And a number of um, individual shoreline property owner surveys to try to get at what what are what are property owners' perspectives on 
either shoreline management in general or more specifically armory? What are their concerns? What are their barriers to, to doing something softer? A couple of the key projects that were that I'll go into a little more detail are a couple of um, graduate student projects from the University of Washington uh, uh, Environmental Management Program. 2006, the uh, project was focused on doing a very intensive survey of all the property owners around Lake Washington. They, I think there's 1,200 properties, and they got surveys back from um, from all, close to 400 that were asked questions about what are people's, tried to dig into what are people's barriers to replacing their hard bulkhead with, uh, with a softer solution. Um, and the results are very interesting and are, and are basically the foundation for what the Green Shoreline Committee and our workshops focused on. The second project, and I'll describe that in a little bit more detail, focused on looking at the permit process because that is one of the um, largest identified barriers uh, within within those surveys. And then, of course, uh, the City of Seattle's uh, great Green Shorelines um, booklet. Um, all of this together really created a great opportunity to really target outreach for salmon recovery, but also to help inform upcoming shoreline master programs. Next slide. So this is the 2007, or the 2006 survey. And what you can see at the top is that um, the permitting process was um, was by and far the the biggest barrier that people identified in in committing to a soft shoreline project. Now, a lot of us that are very familiar with the permitting process say, "Oh, well, but there's shoreline exceptions, but there's this, there's that." We don't know if they're talking about you know trying to get their dock repaired or a new house, and you know, so there's a lot of questions around what that what that really means. Um, but the fact is, is that this is what people's perception was. It was a, it was a, it was a fairly, uh, almost 400 respondents um, came back and said, we're concerned about the permit permitting process is the issue. And then I love this quote that was in, in the survey, and it says, um, I have not pursued the improvements in Green Shoreline uh, partially because my perception is that the regulatory process is a pain. And then, um, by the way, I'm a, I'm a land use attorney, so somebody who should know the process, but they're even concerned about the permitting process. So next slide. Um, so I don't expect you to see these graphs, but uh, one of the graphs comes from the 2008 or 2007 um, graduate project that they tried to map out the permitting process relative to uh, promoting a green shoreline. And the other um, graph is done by the Office of Regulatory Assistance doing the same thing. So these are the same process in two different forms. The main point is that it's complex, and we all know that. Um, but there were a couple of key recommendations that came out of the, out of the uh, Keystone um, project where they really dug into this permitting process, this perception of the permitting, the permitting process is, is a barrier. And they came up with some fairly simple recommendations that I think we often forget. And that is that um, that we need to coordinate better between different sectors of the regulatory community, whether it's a contractor, a consultant, a um, state agency representative, a local agency representative. We all really know our individual process very well, but we don't know what the federal person does or what the local person does. So we need to do a better job working together. And that was really the impetus for the workshops in 2009. Um, a couple other things that they recommended was that we look at a streamlined uh, process for these Green Shoreline projects. Um, so with this, the Green Shoreline Committee formed and sort of it came up with this idea for having four workshops to focus on these four topics. So first of all, how do we define the green shorelines? Let's get some, let's get try to get some uh, uh, agreement on how we're going to define green shorelines. We're going to look at the permitting process. We're going to look at initiatives for uh, shoreline restoration, and then um, we're going to look at sort of non-regulatory, uh, voluntary approaches to improving shoreline habitat. So we're just focusing on the permitting process. So next slide. Um, 
So what the Green Shorelines Committee then took forward and what, what, what we got out of that one workshop that was focused on the regulatory uh, piece was that we should consider a pilot project within the Lake Washington um, area to look at streamlining green shorelines projects. These are something that, uh, these are projects that uh, may be on private property, they may be private improvements, but they're something that have public benefit. That they're, they're, they're improving the condition of the shoreline, therefore we should give them a regulatory um, relief in, in doing the right thing. Um, the the uh, conclusion of that effort is that we looked at legislation in 2010. There are a number of people here that were involved in that. And the main reason, I think, and there may be other perspectives, that it didn't move forward was that we couldn't define what a green shoreline, what a green shoreline was. Or maybe more importantly, we couldn't define what a green shoreline isn't. Um, so I think we've made some progress in that in that regard with, with some more recent projects. So maybe it's time to relook at that, but that's where that initiative went. Um, the other thing was to more fully utilize the existing Army Corps of Engineer programmatic, pro programmatic excuse me. And this was a regional um, uh, programmatic exemption. Uh, uh, a reference biological evaluation that the, that the Corps developed that they basically created thresholds for um, soft shoreline projects. So if you propose to do a project on a residential piece of property um, that you're going to regrade the beach, you're going to add less than X amount of fill in the water, um, then you would fall, you would fall under this um, uh, programmatic and you wouldn't have to go through individual consultation. So that was available, but people didn't really know about it. They weren't utilizing it. Um, and then um, another key uh, initiative for the Green Charlines Committee was just looking at what are all the variety of different incentives that are out there, and let's make sure that we can explain those and make sure that that, um, that the jurisdictions and the consultants and the contractors are aware of what those are and how they can take advantage of them. A couple other recommendations that we um, that we didn't get to conclusion with. Um, we did look at a sales tax exemption. One of the ideas uh, from the workshop was that if somebody, if a property owner or a contractor could be exempted from sales tax for uh, the materials that they use in the green shoreline, that might be a uh, reduce some barrier. That, for a number of reasons, was way too complex and and didn't um, look to be feasible in terms of legislation. Um, and then uh, looking at other permit exceptions. So whether it be um, looking at these projects through a shoreline exemption or through an um, exception, uh, exemption to the hydraulic code, um, those are still conversations that are going on, I think, in different, in different uh, venues. And um, there are probably a number of examples um, that uh, that we should update and look at those again. Um, and I think that's my last slide. So um, I'm happy to entertain questions, or I don't know if we want to. Have you have time for a few questions? Question. Do you have any? Can you say follow up from that? The one thing I've heard some things about is the regional, the use of the programmatic. Do you have any other follow up of that you can give? Some gee, this is what we've seen that has happened since. Can, can you repeat the questions, Jim? Um, so you, you were wondering specifically about programmatic and we follow up? Yeah. Um, Jason, do you know? People use it off and on. Um, I don't know that it's been widely uh, identified. You know, like you said, I think it's still challenging for people on an individual basis to know if it's out there available. But I know that it has been applied. Yeah, I've heard from the consultants, and I don't know if there's anybody in the room that, that would agree or disagree with this. Was, that, that this was a really key barrier in terms of um, the consult consulting side of things, that prior any fill in the water required individual consultation. No matter if you were trying to do the right thing or not, you had to go through an extensive process. What, what this programmatic did was it allowed, said if you can stay within this threshold, you can, you can go ahead with, with adding uh, regrading the beach and adding fill in the water, and I think that was a that was a big step 
uh, in making these processes more efficient within Lake Washington. Now remember, Lake Washington is a very simple, um, a, a relatively simple uh, area in terms of the factors that are, go into these green shorelines, where it's a, the lake elevation is controlled, um, so we don't have the tidal influence that you have on a lot of marine shorelines. We don't have the, as much of the um, complex near shore uh, ecology, uh, you know, with eelgrass and, and um, surf smell and those kinds of things. So, so I, I think it was easier to write a uh, sort of a box rule for Lake Washington than it may be for other areas. Any other questions? Did the uh, National Marine Fishery Service, did their, uh, they play a role that we had really good representation from all levels of the regulatory community, so including the core and national marine fisheries, um, as well as contractors and some home, home, homeowners. So all the, everybody got to say where they think the problem is um, and what their recommendations were for trying to make improvements to this. And it was good for all of us to hear what the contractors had to say. You know where where they see the barriers, but National Marine to, add, to answer your question more specifically, National Marine Fisheries was part of that. They've been part of um, through their involvement with the Corps, um, with a lot of the coordination work, specifically in Lake Washington related to ESA, their ESA concerns. Yeah. Did, uh, did any of the Did any of the property owners follow through with creating green shorelines on their property as a result of the workshop? Is that characterization? Um, I think in the long term, yes. I mean, the workshops were at a pretty high level, so they were they had three workshops that were very specific on on different topics, and then the last workshop was we invited the general public, the property owners, to come, and we pre presented them with what we were hearing. Uh, what the results were from the first three workshops. So it was a good opportunity to sort of uh, ground test some of the things that we were hearing were incentives um, and get their reaction to whether they are incentives or not. Um, so, but it wasn't, we didn't provide a site-specific boilerplate design, but it was introducing a lot more people to the concept, getting them excited about it, and, and sort of recognizing that we were hearing their concerns, whether it be erosion concerns, whether it be cost concerns, and that we were going to try to work towards um, addressing some of those concerns either through um, trolling master program updates or through other incentive pieces. And there's been a lot of work that's gone on uh, that continues to go on related to uh, incentives. Um, there's um, Nicole, I think, are you going to talk about the green chores for homes at all? Um, so there's some grants that have been um, given to different organizations to look more at incentives. Um, there, um, we have a uh, coastal fellow that's, that's been with our agency for um, two years that's really trying to get at this, define what a green shoreline is, is or, and is not. Um, and some of these questions that really were raised in this in this um, form that I think are, are key to answer that need to be answered before we move forward. One more question, John. In the back.
so the was the question or statement um, to the tune of that if the regional general permit or the Corps exemption doesn't um, doesn't um, get rid of the consultation requirement between National Marine Fisheries and the applicant, that it really doesn't do any good. It doesn't help with with the with the uh, efficiency of the process. Is that is that sort of the yeah, and so, so there's there's some complicated terminology, but you know the court can, and I don't know if there's anybody here from the court that can probably speak to this more precisely with the right terminology than I can. But but the court can authorize um, what they call regional general permits. So that's a type of activity that they say if you meet the standards, you stay within this box, that you're part of this regional general permit. Sort of pre-authorize this type of development, um, but they have to reauthorize those every so often, and that takes away the consultation requirement between National Marine Fisheries, or at least it makes it more efficient. Um, the court can also issue what they call a programmatic, which means that they write a biological evaluation uh, similar to a regional general permit, sort of pre-analyzing a certain type of activity, but they haven't formalized it into a regional general permit. So this. Um, dealing with the with fill in water fill related to green shorelines was a programmatic. It never developed into a, a regional general permit, but it, it's a different name. But it was intended to have the same effect. Uh, yeah. This this these the question was: Is this limited to Lake Washington? Yeah. This is Lake Washington Lake Sammamish. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I need to ask a question. How many people here either have been through or know of or engaged in permitting processes, local, state? So part of the reason I wanted to ask that is a level of understanding of what we're talking about. Because we're going we're to get into the weeds here. We know we're getting into the weeds with everybody, but we also want to make sure that everybody is starting from a pretty similar level of knowledge about the permit process, which it sounds like you do have. But if you have, if you're not familiar with some of these pieces of <coughs> the process, either ask the person next to you to explain it, or come kind of pull somebody aside during one of the breaks and let us help you catch up to speed so that you get what we're trying to work through here. Okay, I mean, we're going to shift now to uh, going to San Juan Islands and that program. So I'm going to introduce Amy Windrup. And when Amy is now with the Department of Fish and Wildlife, where she's currently a lead for the uh, Columbia Basin Mitigation Policy, and well, with a focus on salmon restoration and wildlife issues. But prior to that, Amy was the project manager for the San Juan Initiative, which was a public-private partnership to assess the effectiveness of shoreline protection. And that is what she's going to talk about. So Amy. And just a reminder for speakers that this is being, we're streaming this because not everybody can come today, so we're trying to make sure as many people get access to this. You need to speak into the microphone and repeat questions as, so that everybody out there in YouTube land can hear this. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Amy Windrow, and I was the project manager for the San Juan Initiative. I'm going to wait for my slide. But in the meantime, I will show you the pretty book that we created. And in this is more details than, uh, than I will talk about today. But if you'd like to look at it, please come find me. So the San Juan Initiative. Oh, that's really close. <laughs> uh, okay, so the San Juan Initiative asked one central question, which is what is working, what is not, for shoreline protection in San Juan County. Next slide. I'm going to tell this story and essentially Two parts. The first part the evaluation phase, and that occurred between 2006 and 2009. And then we had an opportunity through an EPA grant for the lead organization to go back and look at how effective uh, the recommendations were. So did the work that we did in 2007 and 2009, did it actually make a difference? So the first part of the story is about evaluating the effectiveness of education, incentive, and regulatory programs. And we did that um, with a what was called a policy group, which were 12 county council appointed citizens. And they were joined by the relevant state and uh, local agencies, nonprofit groups. We evaluated the programs, and then we developed recommendations. And then essentially we sunset. 
Time goes by, five years later, we looked again to see what those recommendations did. Next slide. So in evaluating these programs, we looked at them from three perspectives. The first perspective was from the science view. We did a shoreline characterization in four key study areas in San Juan County. Those four key study areas represent about 10% of the county. In those areas, we wanted to see um, the things that we cared most about, the things that were most ecologically important in San Juan County, were they being protected? So we were looking at feeder bluffs, um, pocket beaches, forage fish beaches, um, eelgrass beds in particular, and shoreline vegetation. So those case study areas have all of those components. And in addition, the areas had small parcels, big parcels, ferry terminals, ports, other things like that within them. We then looked at the policy side. So we looked at permits. So we pulled, uh, in the shoreline characterization, we documented all the shoreline change, every bulkhead, every dock, every stairway, um, amount of vegetation along the shoreline. We then married that up with permits in the state and county databases to find out um, was there a permit for these structures, were there conditions for the structures, um, and were they complied with. That was the policy piece. And then finally we did an enormous amount of community engagement. So we actually used those case study areas as focus groups to understand from the community's perspective what was working and what was not. And uh, I kind of wish that Joe and I like, had done a, um, a tag team presentation because much of the work that Joe just reflected on and what he learned from the community is absolutely consistent with what we learned from the community. Okay, next slide. So out of that enormous amount of work, we came up with essentially five recommendations. The first one is that our shoreline protection programs are improving over time. So permits written in the past, are less clear, less specific than permits written in the more recent times. We are still losing some of our most sensitive shorelines. There's a lack of accountability, and I'm going to talk a little bit about fairness and how that plays out in the permitting system. And our current regulatory efforts are turning people off, and they're not meeting their uh, technical assistance needs. And finally, there is a lot of room to improve, and in San Juan County, there's a lot left to protect, so it's worth our effort and our time to do things differently. I'm going to focus, go ahead and press the little button there. I'm going to focus on just three of, the, of these, uh, these findings. Next slide. So the first one is that we are losing some of our most critical habitats. So when we looked at, when we looked at the shoreline characterization, what we saw was that feeder bluffs in particular are a pretty rare shore form in San Juan County. They're about, in our case study areas, they're about 10% of the shoreline. But what we saw was that 30% of those feeder bluffs had been armored. And that was despite the permitting system not allowing uh, armoring on feeder bluffs. We also found that 25% uh, of the docks were in areas of eelgrass. And that of those areas that were armored, which was about 12% of our case study area, 80% of the armoring was low enough in the water or low enough in the tidal elevation to be in areas of forage fish. And that about half of the armoring was, in fact, on forage fish beaches. So not only was the armoring occurring in the places that are most sensitive and that we most want to protect, but the armory was low enough in the water to impact the thing that we were trying to protect. In addition, I wanted to say that when we looked at the beaches and we looked at shoreline vegetation, what we found was that homes set back um, less than 50 feet lost more shoreline vegetation than homes set back farther. Okay, next slide. We are not meeting the community's technical assistance and education needs. In San Juan County in around 2007, there were, um, there were efforts to educate shoreline property owners about protection. There were efforts to uh, educate them about the importance of eelgrass, the importance of shoreline vegetation. In reality, shoreline property owners want three things. They want a view, they want a dock or a mooring buoy, and they want to have access to the water. Those are the three things they're focused on. So as a community member, that's what you're asking yourself. You're asking yourself, how can I get a view? You're not asking yourself, how important is my eelgrass? And so the, the education was not married up very effectively with the questions that people were asking. In addition, our regulatory efforts, um, well, I can talk about that one next, actually. Okay, go ahead and uh, next slide. There's a lack of accountability. What we saw in San Juan County was that, uh, so for instance, just taking bulkheading, about a third of the case study area was armored. And when we looked at that, we thought, well, that armoring is of all different ages. It's some of it's very old, some of it's very new, some of it's falling apart. It's all different ages. But of the third of the case study that was armored, we were only able to find nine county permits and 12 state permits. So when you think about, okay, some of those 
bulkheads were put in before there was a regulatory system. Some of those were probably put in before there were databases. But some of those, those structures were put in more recently. But we did not have an understanding of which ones were which. When we looked at docks and we asked the questions, a very small subset of all the structures that we saw because we weren't able to find many of the permits, sadly. Um, in San Juan County, there's been multiple databases over the years. A lot of information is kept in three by five cards or in boxes. So it was a very onerous process to look at the, the permit system. But for docks, for instance, when we were able to pull the permits themselves, what we found was about 50% of the dock permits, of the docks, were out of information that we're giving them and essentially we're disincentivizing them to do what we want them to do which is be protective of their shoreline and in fact the county did respond one of the neighbors um, did tell on the other neighbors and they received a letter asking them not to do that again <laughs> all right next slide Okay, so what do we recommend? Out of all these findings, um, the policy group, which were citizens, got together and said, geez, we gotta be able to do this better. So we came up with a bunch of recommendations. I'm just gonna highlight a few. The first was to tailor protection. We know that there are places on our shoreline that are more susceptible to change than other places, and that we should focus our regulatory, our incentive, our education programs in those places. In San Juan County, that's feeder bluffs and porch fish beaches, essentially, and eelgrass areas. And so if we have limited resources, which we have, we cannot do everything everywhere. So given that we know we don't have enough people to act in the county, let's focus those people on the places that we know we want to protect. Improve accountability. The recommendation was to actually to create a real enforcement program and to require inspections and to provide technical assistance and incentives that were tailored to those places that we most care about. Okay, next slide. So time goes by. Um, and what had happened? So what happened was is that when the San Juan Initiative sunset in 2009, the policy group, these citizens said, hey, you know what, wouldn't it be great if we could find out if we spent all this time working on this if we actually made a difference? And we said, you know what, that would be kind of cool. So we came up with these metrics of success. And these were just a few, there were about seven of them, and there were things that said, you know, if these things happen, we know we will have made a difference. So the first one was the county and the state would have a new permit system. And that, in fact, has happened. The county and the state both have a new permit system. And in fact, the state's permit system is transparent 
and it allows you to, um, they can actually, as a county, you can ask WFW to ping your county when a, when a permit comes up in your area, which is a great way to get that coordination that Joe was talking about between county and state. The next metric was that there would be no new bulk kits without a permit. I mean, it's just the, the citizens were appalled with the amount or with the lack of permitting. And they just felt that this is just basic. We, we have to have permits. The second piece was that post-construction inspections would be occurring 75% of the time. That means that they recommend a creating inspection program and then get out there and look at what's going on. If we do it for the homes, why not do it for the shoreline structures? Riparian vegetation not being decreased below 88% for any individual property and that technical assistance would be available. So we went and we looked and what did we find? This is the great part of the story. So time goes by and in fact WDFW got a grant with San Juan County and with Kitsap County and I think um, Susan Key is going to talk a little bit about that to go back and look. Because as I mentioned earlier, in 2009 we didn't know, uh, we didn't have a baseline. We just knew that we were looking at everything that had happened in the past in San Juan County. But now we had a baseline. We had 2006 data that we could go back and we look for the last six years to find out what was happening in those six years. So from the incentive side, what we saw is that incentives had been occurring. So for one thing, green green homes, green shores for homes has been created in San Juan County. They're using a lot of information. Susan's going to talk about it. It's a great thing. It allows people to both retrofit their home and as well as new building. The San Juan Preservation Trust and the Friends of San Juan's began to look at new incentives for working with small property owners. So here's the deal. In San Juan County, the places that we really care about, those beaches, have been developed, uh, are some of the oldest developments. Due to historical patterns of development, those beaches are like little tiny piano keys. Do, 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 do. Whereas the rocky shorelines of San Juan County are much larger parcels. And so what we saw was that in order to protect those beaches, you have to work with maybe 15 to 20 property owners. And land trusts really aren't set up for that kind of uh, that kind of working with property owners. So they're working on ways to actually work across the neighborhoods to do more protection, which is pretty exciting. Next slide. All right, what about accountability? So in 2008, we found 50% of uh, permits were out of compliance. We then said, okay, let's create that inspection program. By the time the San Juan Initiative had sunset, there was the beginnings of, a, of an inspection program. We went back and we looked at all of the structures and all the permits that had been done on the shoreline between 2006, 2012, and what we found was that less than 1%, 1% had been inspected. Now, in defense of San Juan County, in 2006, you guys will recall that we entered a nasty recession that required a lot of counties to let people go. So I think that this is, this is not a good finding. This is a red flag. This is a, this is a hey, San Juan County, um, keep working here. <laughs> this would be a good place to put effort. But I also think that it's the beginning of change in San Juan County. They, they do have the process in place. It's just not completely implemented. Next slide. We also looked at new, new bulkheads. All right, this was, one of, this was one of the most important things to the policy group. In 2012, we went and we did a boat survey and we looked at that shoreline again and we documented change. We found 634 parcels, that was the number of parcels in all our case study areas. About 32 of them had some sort of change. Only half of those had permits. But you might say to yourself, well, okay, maybe those are for stairs. Maybe those are little fixes. Well, in fact, 10% or rather 63% of them were for shoreline armory, for new shoreline armory. And so when, when we found this first study, when we found this first finding in 2009, we said unpermitted activity is an issue. We got a lot of pushback from the community saying, ah, that's old stuff. Everything's permitted now. Well, this finding tells us that 50% of what's happening on San Juan County shoreline is in fact unpermitted activity. Next slide. Conclusion is that our shoreline database really does not reflect the change on the shoreline. So if you want to know what's happening on the shoreline, you really cannot go to the database. You actually have to get on a boat and go look. Next slide. Okay, finally, shoreline vegetation. So our goal was that 88 percent of forest cover in each parcel would be retained. That in fact happened when we looked at places that had been developed and we looked at all the parcels along the shoreline. In fact, they had maintained their shoreline vegetation. But where loss was occurring was an overhanging vegetation. And I would say, generally, most overhanging vegetation was retained. But where there was loss, it was sort of catastrophic loss. And in fact, in those places where there were loss was again the places that we cared most about, which was on forage fish beaches. 
So we only saw four parcels that lost substantial amounts of overheading vegetation, three of them for forage for species, which continues to sort of highlight for me that um, the places we care most about are where we need to spend more energy protecting. Next slide. Okay, so now this is the infomercial section. So, new technology can help us with this accountability. The Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife has developed two new tools that are available for you all to, um, to take advantage of. And Tim Quinn, Tim, please raise your hand to the back. Tim Quinn can talk to you about this if you're interested. Next slide. I'm going to talk just very briefly about the high resolution. So the, uh, the slide on the, on the right there is how we used to look at um, shoreline change and vegetation change. The, the slide on the left is a high resolution. And so you can see that we have much better technology in order to see change in forest cover. Next slide. So this was just an example from Kitsap County. Next slide. And you can see that in 2006, just look at the shoreline, you can see where the trees were, and in 2009, you can see where they were removed. The program can automate this, and you can actually get the program to look at your shoreline and come up with a number for how much change you've seen. And you, the, the model actually can predict where you're going to see change. You can do this just for your shoreline parcels. You can do it for your entire county. So it's pretty cool. All right, next slide. Okay, so in conclusion, I'd say that the most important things from, from the San Juan County were is that we need to continue on both the care and the stick. We need to both improve our accountability, our inspection, and our enforcement programs to stop unemployment activity, and we need to continue our incentives. Next slide. And I just want to finish, you know, um, I forget the man's name who started us, but he talked about how you have to appeal to people in talking about shorelines, and in fact, I think that's absolutely right, is that it's not just an intellectual exercise, it's an exercise of the heart. So I thought I'd end with an E. Cummings poem. It goes like this. Maggie, Millie, and Molly, and May went down to the beach to play one day, and Maggie discovered a shell that sang so sweetly she couldn't remember her troubles. And Millie befriended a stranded star whose rays five languid fingers were. And Molly was chased by a horrible thing which raised sideways by blowing bubbles. And May came home with a smooth round stone, as small as the world, as large as alone. For whatever we lose, like a you or a me, it's always ourselves we find in the sea. Thank you. Um, I'd be sure to repeat the question since we're live. Yes. Um, my first question, my question is, when you talked about the 50 foot versus the 100 foot setback and the difference, could you elaborate on that? That's not very interesting. So essentially when we looked at, yes, so the question was the, the difference between the 50 foot setback and the 100 foot setback, what was the difference in the, in the vegetation? And I don't, I have to let me pull my little notes here. Essentially what we found was that folks that were set back more, well it's a little bit of a longer story. So folks that were set back less than 50 feet um, had a much higher chance of having, having armoring. So 67% had armoring compared to a setback of 40%. So, so if you were 100 feet set back, you were a 40% chance of having armoring, whereas if you were 50 feet set back, you were a 67% chance of having armoring. So the closer you were, the closer you were to armoring. And those parcels that had armoring had less vegetation. That's the, that's the logic train there. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Were there ever, uh, were any shoreline uh, protection structures denied by the county or the state? Yes, they were. We found some that were denied, and we also found that those that were denied were often then approved on subsequent um, appeal through the Shoreline's Hearings Board. And so we did find them. Yes, ma'am. Um, the two tools at the end, can you uh, go over those briefly again and say who is contacting the Oh, yes. In fact, there was a website that if um, there was a website that was just that I'd given to the nice lady to help me, and essentially it's um, Tim. She's asking where she can get understand those tools. Do you want to say one word or two about that? Can you come up, Tim, and say that? Sure. This is Tim Quinn. He's the chief scientist for the Habitat Program for WFW. So she wondered about. So, uh, Amy, is this it? The, yes. 
so there, there is a website just uh, newly available where you can download uh, what we call high resolution change detection. It's a product that was funded through EPA and the organization grant for shorelines. And um, I will, we gave the, uh, the web address to somebody here. That's it, right there. I can write it down. Oh, there it is. Okay, fantastic. So the, the idea here is that you can download for your county or for any part of your county, and all counties in the Puget Sound uh, ecosystem or in the Puget Sound Basin has all the information available on the type of change between 2006 and 2009, what has changed, has gone from vegetation to what type of change and so forth, and you can quantify this. This was all set up to, to provide for opportunities for partnerships between the Department of Fish and Wildlife and counties or local jurisdictions that had planning requirements and wanted to help keep track of their own changes to the critical area ordinances or shoreline master plan uh, provisions and so forth. So uh, we are currently looking for opportunities to partnership with uh, counties that want to use this information. Um, we'll try to help uh, provide this information in a useful way, try to uh, equip your GIS technicians, if you have them, uh, with the tools that they need to quantify this and how to set up an adaptive management program if you're interested uh, with our science program of the department. Does it cost money? It is for free. Our favorite cost. <laughs> Fresh water and salt water? It, it is for, um, it is for uh, freshwater lodic systems, so flowing river systems, and for saltwater shorelines. I don't, I don't think we've done freshwater shorelines, but we have the capability of doing that. So if there's a special request, if you can partner with us, we can probably provide that or, or show you how to do that. Yes, sir? How do we feel that it works on smaller changes of the picture? Is it rather dramatic changes condition? And I actually did a photo analysis by visual characterizing those so it's about the error and, and accuracy of the assessment we've done a lot of that and I'm, I'm just a spokesperson the, the person that's the GIX expert uh, is Ken Pierce and he'll be the one you're in contact with but the, the the revolutionary part of this the cutting edge part of this is that we can detect change as small as one quarter acre which is about as small as you can do visually with with aerial photography um, and then we've done this a very extensive uh, exercise where we quantified the, the error rates and, and we've, we've actually developed a process where um, we've uh, eliminated commission error and it's a long process and it's, it's pretty, pretty detailed but you can actually look at everything that the, the probability model suggests has changed and because that's a relatively small proportion of the entire basin you can actually view those in real time on a computer that has been set up for that process. It's it's really exciting stuff in the sense that it's it's uh, it takes what used to take um, hours and hours and hours looking at photos and and drawing with grease pencils and then putting that into a GIS to quantify the area. It's now all been automated with this fancy software. So it's pretty neat stuff. Does it also identify locations? It does. Yes. The, the question is, it, is it spatially explicit? Does it tell you where you are in the landscape? And the answer is yes, it does. Okay, one more question. Oh, one more question for you guys. Well, um, so there was a of tools. So what is the second tool? Oh, um, that tool is less well developed. Um, <laughs> and we, uh, we developed a, a process for trying to quantify change along the shorelines using the boat survey. Um, because it is very difficult to do it otherwise. Um, oftentimes when we're interested in trying to do compliance checks, um, we have to ask permission to be on people's property and oftentimes we're turned, turned uh, away from doing that. 
So for the first time that our agency has been involved in permitting, we actually tried to quantify the amount of unpermitted activity on the shoreline. And we did this again with an EPA grant um, uh, uh, on, on land owners. And it's, it's, so we developed this methodology for taking, a, taking photos and looking at them simultaneously, the oblique photos from ecology overlaid with parcel maps that tell you where you are with a navigation tool in a boat that tells you you're right in front of a, a certain place. I think I'm, I've, I've been hooked. <laughs> Joe and Amy and Tim, thank you. And we're going to take a 15 minute break, but before we break, I want you to be doing a couple things. First of all is, what did you hear and what did you learn? Who can you connect with? What ideas do you have that you can bring to the table? And all of that, just keep thinking because this is what, why we're here and what we want to gather from all of you. So you're not off the hook. So we're going to take a 15 minute break, break and we'll be back, thanks.
more than ably um, uh, stood in for, that's the right word, by Susan Key, who also works for San Juan, San Juan County as a stewardship, Shoreline Stewardship Coordinator. And I can tell you, she is someone who has her pulse on the finger on these issues. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Great. Um, so I have my pulse on the finger. I like that. Uh, every, every single speaker so far has hit some really incredibly awesome high points. And Dave started us off by saying, if we really want to relate to shoreline landowners, we've got to come from their perspective. And Sam, who is our new director of planning, planning and community development in San Juan County, worked in Jefferson County as a consultant. And on that very topic, and so I'm going to talk in the first part of my presentation about her work. Then she moved to San Juan County, and I have the pleasure of working with her now. She's my new boss, so uh, we're really excited about some of the positive changes that are, that are happening. And after Amy's presentation, I can say that because we didn't look so good. <laughs> So, Jefferson County uh, got an EPA grant to do a pilot study, which was to, development, to, do, to develop and implement a project called Square One. And the objectives were to develop a coaching model to change behavior. That's what we're all about. That's, that's the common thread that we've heard from all the speakers so far. How do we change behavior? And I'd like you to think about coaching. What does that verb mean to you, coaching? Next slide. And so a second objective was to get property owners to work with planning staff to learn about their property's attributes and sustainable practices. So when we say a property's attributes, what are we talking about? If you're a property owner and you come into the planning department and you have a planner that says, oh, you have a class two wetland, this is gonna be a really tough permit. <laughs> so I wanna ask, how many people actually process land use permits? Two, like, Okay, maybe 10 of you? Okay. So, that's kind of one of the places where the rubber meets the road, is what happens in that interaction, and we're gonna talk more about that as we move through this presentation. And bring me up one more. So, the research met methodology behind this square one project was to develop a work group with a wide range of participants, architects, realtors, residential contractors, staff from all over the place. They really dug into this. And next slide. Out of that came two focus groups. So they, the, the work group wanted to pick the brains of people. Two groups, permit consultants. These folks are key if there is one group of people that you want to get your message to, get it to your permit consultants. There aren't that many of them. We have in San Juan County, six. So that's one of my key target audiences. If those folks know what's coming down the pike and what resources are available, they convey that to their clients. That's, that's one of the important steps and owners, builders, so that's kind of the do-it-yourselfers. That's a whole other category of folks that you need to target your research or your uh, outreach to. Next slide. And the next one. And so what came out of that really in-depth picking the brains of folks? Everything that's been said by Joe and by Amy holds true. So. All of what Joe said about the fact that the permit process is the biggest block, and on down the line that graph 
uh, that, he, that he showed and, and what Amy talked about. All of that holds true as well. So I'm kind of building on that now when I say process shifting. When I say that, how many people know what that means? Sam did the same thing when she started. She's like, I'm all about process shifting. And all of the staff are like, uh-huh. <laughs> what do you mean? So we have kind of the old way of doing things. And now we have a bunch of information that's come out in the last two to three years. We have a lose, lose, lose. We have a lose for property owners. We have a lose for especially local staff, county staff are the ones on the front lines trying to make all these state and federal re regulations mean something. Staff's frustrated, especially when we have a recession and we have budget cuts and now you're doing two jobs and getting paid for one. Property owners are frustrated, permit staff are frustrated. And what's happening on the ground? Amy's research shows and maybe it's not so bad in other counties but we're kind of finding that that it there's a lot of unpermitted work out there whether it's shoreline or not so our resources are losing as well the whole point of of this forum and the work that we're all trying to do is how do we shift that to a win 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 and that's our process shifting that's kind of the general definition. So what's the nuts and bolts of how do we actually make that happen? Next slide. And so one of the keys is that the applicants consider the principles of sustainable site design at the beginning, and the beginning is italicized, of their development process. Right now, how many people can say that landowners really want to come into the planning department Nobody's raising their hand. We've got a problem. <laughs> we need to sh shift that so that landowners realize it's a source of information that, that when they come, they're not going to just get told no. And that ties in with a second big piece, which is a coaching relationship. So what Square One found is what the owner builders and the permit contractors want is a place to go to get information, accurate information, up-to-date information. What can you do? Excellent. And the next one. And so one of the primary objectives is to promote the use of square one as the initial step in conceptualizing land use projects in a way that is protective of the environment. And again, it's the initial step. And the primary goal is to realize increased use of coaching services and pre-application meetings and site visits. So pre-application is getting them before they have applied for a permit. And how do we do this when our county staff are doing two jobs and getting paid for one? And so that's the question. How do we get the resources to take this to the next level, which is providing information before folks apply for a permit? Next slide. And so Sam moves to San Juan County. Go ahead. And you can just pop them all up there. Small county, 16,000, small tax base. The cool thing is we have 55% developed and we have 45% undeveloped shoreline parcels. And that is a huge opportunity for protection. So we're really trying to do some catch up here so that we can start doing it right. We have a history of success and innovation. Our county was the county that started the Marine Resources Committee, and now there's several of them around Puget Sound. And next slide. And hey, guess what? We're a destination for people and fish. <laughs> and the next slide. We've got 407, 408 miles of shoreline. You'll see a couple numbers. It depends on, on the tides. Next slide. And this is a Barbara Rosencotter slide. Barbara does our salmon recovery work in San Juan Island. And the shows in red and blue the very rivers and out migrating salmon pathways in the Salish Sea. And the next slide. 
and all stocks have been found using the San Juan Islands near shore for both in and out migration. And we're talking, we find fish from the Columbia River. And so Barbara says, show me a river and I'll show you a fish. <laughs> and so how many people here have actually been in the San Juans to visit? <laughs> show me the islands and I'll show you visitors. Okay, next slide. Why? People like to come, there's a lot of variety there. It's islands gorgeous. Fish like to come, there's a lot of variety there. It's a buffet. We've got eelgrass, we've got kelp, and all of the prey species that need those two habitats. We've got feeder bluffs. So we've got all the forage fish species. Next slide. We've also got shoreline stressors. Thankfully, we're not 70% armored, uh, but we do have a lot going on that impacts the near shore habitat. Next slide. And so this is what's interesting to me. Right about the same time Sam and her friend were talking about, wouldn't it be great if we could develop a one-stop shop for folks to come get permits? And the square one concept was, was built. Barbara and I, and Mary Naxted, who's now with Department of Health, were having the same conversation. Wouldn't it be great if we could turn the tide and shoreline landowners were excited about the habitat that they had? They looked at it like it's increasing their property value. How cool is it that you have shoreline property and you have eelgrass? And that's not really what's happening now, so we're still trying to turn the tide. Next slide. And go ahead and pop up the next two. So out of that, the Green Shores for Homes uh, program, the San Juan County joined in with the City of Seattle, and we're working also transboundary with uh, some folks in BC. Now this isn't the same as Green Shorelines, which is Lake Washington, but it's built on that. So Green Shores for Homes is developing a credit rating system similar to LEED and other rating systems for properties. And the objectives are to provide incentives for shoreline landowners, training for realtors, and I want to circle realtors, they're key in this process, local contractors and consultants, to expand services offered by local businesses and to promote sustainable shoreline development. Next slide. And go ahead and pop the next one. So. And so again, we come to the same conclusion that they did in square one. It's ideal to reach property owners before they invest time and money in the designs and permits. And if you were at the last Shoreline Forum, you saw this same slide. How do you do that? Pre-application meetings and site visits. Process shifting from just saying no to, go ahead, next slide. Providing information, ideas, innovation, and inspiration. Next slide. And so that's what we're hoping to do. And Susan Key, Shoreline Stewardship Coordinator, and next slide. And Sam is uh, the director. So any questions? One minute for Any questions? So even though there, we didn't have questions right now, there will be an opportunity for you to talk about your experiences, your ideas, etc. So um, that will be coming up after the next two presenters. So I'd like to next introduce Dennis Hanberg, who is the Director of Planning and Land Services for Pierce County. I don't know him from before today, but I can tell that he's an incredible dynamo. He was helping do this redo of Pierce County, and now he's the director. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity today. Um, it's kind of interesting. I spent, as you can see from my bio, I spent 30 years uh, trying to get permits, and um, I think I probably wore the county down, so they said, why don't you come on over here and start giving them? So uh, that's what I've been working on the last few years. Um, my effort today really comes about, um, 
about creating what, what we call the best permitting agency in the state. And um, go ahead, next slide. Uh, basically, uh, during the uh, mid 2000s, uh, becoming the or the uh, Pierce County uh, was uh, facing several difficult challenges. Uh, basically, we were weighted down by complex regulations, uh, outdated handouts, too many inboxes to get a project reviewed. And I think you saw that earlier chart, that kind of that uh, flow chart, it was taking 15 to 17 inboxes, and that's how we were trying to count how long it takes to get a permit when you have that many decision makers in any one permit. Um, we had poor morale, poor customer service. Our, our review times were uh, uh, pushing uh, 12 to 16 weeks for uh, just a building permit. Uh, sometimes two to three hours uh, waiting for information in our uh, in our lobby. Perfecting the image. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, our lobby basically Pierce County. Just a little bit of background. We have about. Uh, 800,000 people in the in the county, about 400,000 in the unincorporated area. We have a fairly large urban growth area, uh, so there's quite a bit of permit activity at the county level. Um, our lobby, we see about uh, uh, 10 to 15,000 people per year. So there's a lot of people coming in asking for questions. About two thirds of those people are asking for general information. They just want to know what they can do with their property. So that was part of what we tackled. I want you to tell me which, am I on the right uh, slide next, for you? Well, go ahead and let's go to the next slide. Uh, so basically in 2011, because of the, uh, uh, of the pressure from the, the public and the uh, challenges, uh, both the exec and the council got together and said, we need to do something to improve our permitting process. And so they put together a team of uh, public works officials and uh, planning people and said, let's figure out a way to possibly incorporate them all into one group. Um, and uh, the study was put together called uh, Creating the Best Permitting Agency in the State. I happen to have the benefit of, next slide, uh, being, the, um, uh, uh, being on the committee, uh, basically as a consultant rather than as an employee at that time. But the goal of that, that uh, uh, document was to uh, improve the permitting process, improve our decision-making authority, or maximize decision-making authority on one area, again, to try to reduce some of those uh, 17 inboxes. And then also take a look at uh, integrating technology and customer satisfaction. Next slide. The, um, we wanted to retain a competent workforce. At this point in time, we had about a 50% uh, reduction in force due to all the layoffs uh, of the, uh, and the, uh, the depression, as I call it. Next. And of course, we also needed to find a predictable funding base. Our funding base would go uh, from some years, a general fund of support of uh, six million, and the next year, two million, and that makes it very difficult to try to keep any kind of uh, consistency. Next slide. Uh, next. The uh, four areas that we concentrated on were really our uh, customer service, technology integration, timely and reliable decisions, and of course, process improvements. And anytime we made a change in one of those, it really affects all the other things. Next slide. The um, uh, for instance, uh, if we make a, a change in our process, our customers get happy, uh, we do something with our technology, and I'm going to talk about technology today is what I want to focus the most. But uh, in addition to these uh, four core areas, next slide, we also focused on a, a strong management team, uh, something that uh, we hadn't had before, but all of our managers are now rowing the same direction, or I'd like to think they are. Uh, stable funding, as I mentioned, and then a vision, and this vision is really to create the best permitting agency in the state, and everything that we've done, any tasks that we've done, or changes in our process, have been with that in mind. Next slide. The uh, technologies, I as I mentioned, was one I wanted to start on, and that was actually one that uh, was kind of handed to me when I first started. I've only been doing this about, we will be starting my third year, actually starting my third year on February 1st, so just getting started. Uh, developing tools to assist our customers. A lot of what we were doing, kept doing, was developing tools to report what we thought our customers wanted to hear. And I tried to emphasize that what we really needed to do is to help those um, those people understand what we do in a little bit uh, faster time frame. Next. So we started by accepting online applications. And it was fairly straightforward. It's an open portal. Believe it or not, we didn't even give anybody any instructions. Uh, we provided the, uh, the link and allowed them to accept, or, and we started accepting building permits and uh, uh, small garages, outbuildings, and so on online, and then helped them through that process. Next. Uh, we developed eNotify, and essentially our program, or our, our 
uh, permit program had the opportunity to add some things like this, but basically, if you sign up, um, every time your permit's touched, you get an email indicating that someone just looked at your permit, and it gives you a chance to then, um, and you also get a link that you can go see what the comment was. And believe me, this has been a big help because instead of people calling and asking where their permit is, they can track along at any time. On top of that, anybody else can track your permit as well. So we have a lot of people signed up. I think something like 6,000 people are signed up for one e-notify or another. Next. We allow e-payments. Um, that reduced the number of people that were just coming into our lobby just to make a payment on a, uh, uh, on a project. Next. And uh, we encourage, we have a, a online ask a permit technician. So our permit technicians are able to answer questions online. Uh, this started out relatively slow, but right now we're doing about two dozen calls per day that um, our permit technicians uh, get asked. Um, and basically those permit technician questions have anything to do from, uh, they used to be like ask a, or uh, how many chickens can I have? Now they're much more compound, so we've had to improve our process as well. Next. Um, and then of course we updated our PALS website so it's easier to use. Uh, more buttons, a little bit less verbiage. Next. Uh, just touching on the technology, one of our favorite ones is about my property. This is an opportunity to, you can look at any property in Pierce County, you can get all of this information. So go ahead and click through some arrows there. Current zoning, um, application of permits, you can see whether there's other things that are already online. And of course, any kind of uh, sensitive areas or site constraints. So this is a nice feature. And we're trying to encourage more people to use this instead of coming in and see us. <coughs> Attached to that is an aerial GIS, so it immediately ties in any kind of permit application with the GIS. You can put overlays on top of this and, uh, and like I say, play as much as you like at home. And uh, again, uh, what we love to see in our lobby, the focus here is to try to get as much uh, to them electronically. Next. One of the other things we've offered is uh, what we call a dashboard. And originally the idea of this dashboard was to tell everybody what we're doing but we changed this before we rolled it out and really gave somebody a home page where you can see in the top left corner, you can track all of your permits that you're tracking with your e-notify. You can see how long it's taking to get reviewed in the lobby. You've got buttons down in the lower right corner that gives you uh, chances to uh, click into the health department, GIS, and so on. Next. Uh, go ahead and click through those. Um, each application, as I mentioned, on an e-notify, you can see all the different history on it. You can see everybody that's touched it, uh, immediate uh, contact to their, uh, uh, to their email addresses and, and so on. Next. Um, what it did though is, is that, as I mentioned, with the number of people that we have in our lobby, uh, it took our average transaction time from about 40 minutes down to 20 minutes. And uh, that's been a substantial improvement. So with the, with the limited uh, resources we have, we've been able to uh, maintain our, our level of permit technicians and technical support. Next. Um, vision for 2014, we're going to continue to review more applications electronically. We uh, are going to reduce the number of required paper copies. I could have brought one in, but a conditional use permit for just a standard commercial application is about this thick. We're going to drop down to about that uh, probably within the next two months. Next. Uh, we're going to increase our over-the-counter applications. In other words, if we keep them out of the back room and, and approve them on the spot, and we don't need 17 inboxes, we're going to go ahead and do it. And then uh, by the end of the year, we'll be accepting all applications electronically. Uh, last but not least, one of our latest ones is we've been working on uh, video inspections or Skype inspections. Basically, a fairly large county. Um, there are opportunities for us to do some inspections by video. Uh, not all of them, but uh, uh, it has been helpful to use some. For instance, we did a plumbing inspection up at Crystal Mountain. That's a two-hour drive for our inspector to go up, take a look at some inspects some plumbing and come back. We can do it by a, a video Skype inspection, so that's been nice. Um, our, our, uh, what's also been nice is access back. Our, uh, we have a, I've got a uh, online application, so our inspectors are out in the field, and they actually, a lot of times people want to talk to the building official, we tap them in FaceTime, and they get to talk to them right on the spot, which kind of uh, takes the wind out of their sails sometimes when they're uh, not sure that they really wanted to speak that quick to the building official. <laughs> Next. Um, In-house benefits, go ahead and click that. Reduced number of touches. Uh, we have fewer phone calls that have dropped way down. We have 25% fewer people coming into the development center. 
Uh, and again, when you're talking about 10 to 15,000 people, that's a lot less touches that we have in the office. And then more time for quality reviews. Go ahead. Uh, public benefits, we reduced our trip miles by uh, 36 to 50,000 miles. That's just based on where the permit oriented to uh, those that are coming in electronically, uh, no longer driving in, but basically they're submitting them online. And uh, of course, faster turnaround for requests for information, you can see through our, our process. Um, I think that's about it. Next. So all blue skies for Pierce County. <laughs> Questions, what was the initial investment in dollars? And uh, again, some of that was already available through the permit processing. I would estimate that in the first year, this, and this has been about a two and a half year process, um, was about $350,000 in just taking those additional e-notify online applications and so on. After that, it's becoming much more affordable. Yes? So, uh, um, so have you been able to, to judge how the process is playing out on the ground? The, um, the question is, have I been able to uh, uh, judge how it's playing out on the ground? And I would say that one of the goals there is it's hard to measure sometimes that customer satisfaction. I will tell you that uh, when I started, um, the people in, we would have, again, at any time, we'd have 50 to 60 people in our lobby. Um, and that there's this tension that was always there. It was tension between um, staff and, uh, and customers. And that's just dropped way off the off the chart, where you now have this positive energy. Uh, that last slide on the previous uh, uh, show there talked about the, you know there's creative, innovative ideas going on rather than that roadblocks. Uh, complaints to the council have gone to almost zero. We used to average about three or four a week, and they've gone almost zero. Yes. How do you say that critics say you're just saying yes to everything? The, um, our answer to that is, is that we're not saying yes to everything. We are providing timely and reliable decisions, and we are having to say no, but we're saying it quicker. Uh, I think <laughs> sometimes people don't like to hear no, but you may as well be straight up about it and tell them, tell them quicker. So it's not, this is not a, you know, find a yes. Yes? Do you have any observations about um, natural resource-based permits versus um, the other land use and building permit? As far as? Anything that you've observed in, 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 in how your system has benefited them or needs to deal with them differently? Yeah. The question is whether or not there's any difference between the building side of permits or, and the uh, land use and the environmental side of permits. We haven't had a lot of land use permits come in through this process. They're just starting now. Um, I think that one of the big pluses and some of the things I left out of this is from the transparency side, side, everything that we post, all of our public access and so on, have QR codes. And so we're getting a lot more comments and a lot more public input on those that we're submitting from a land use standpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, so we should see more from that standpoint. Yes, sir. Well, similar to the previous speaker, we talked about the uh, accessible right now at state agency. All they have to do is check the address on our website. They can see all of that information. They can see the handouts, the application, the hearing examiner report, uh, the site plan. It's all available. Um, what I would like to see would be more um, you know, interaction between the county and the state. I think there's some redundancy and reviews between county and state agencies that could be resolved. We've resolved a lot of those redundancies here in Pierce County. Why not take it a step further? You're here. <laughs> here <it goes. laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. I hear that you guys can get like over the counter notice of completeness on your applications. We do. We've done that. Actually, uh, that has been in place for years. Um, is it basically the question was is that uh, uh, when do we give a, uh, a completeness uh, on an application? And our completeness is a fairly. Um, 
Uh, open at the beginning is, is that you can get completeness at the time that you submit. We don't do the 28-day um, uh, review. Um, I, speaking as a former consultant, I can tell you that I love this system, uh, and I don't think that our people have abused a completeness at the process. I think the 28-day process is uh, um, wrought with difficulties because you end up starting to review the quality rather than the quantity in the, in the process, and that's not the intent. Thank you. That was great. It's really nice to see how much um, innovation is going on all around the Sailor Sea. I'd like to now introduce Kathleen Barnhart, who is with Kitsap County. She's the water Watershed Project Coordinator. And um, you're going to see another example of innovative efforts that are going on, led in part by Kathleen and her team. Thank you. I don't know, best permitting agency in the state. I think I said it's a little friendly competition. <laughs> um, so the title of our grant was actually a Marine and Near Shore Elite Organization grant that we received. Um, and we're working in partnership with San Juan County and WDFW. And it builds a lot off of the San Juan Initiative and the results that came out of that. And we wanted to branch out and uh, excuse me, take it a little further. Um, so this was a review of our bullet, bullet, bulkhead permitting effectiveness. Uh, next slide, please. So we're a little more than uh, halfway through this project, um, but we wanted to share our progress so far and just let you know that um, there's more to come. But these are our findings so far. Um, the findings I'm going to share today are probably more specific to Kitsap County. Um, but like I said, the broader uh, results will be shared later on, hopefully by the end of this year. So our objectives. What, well, what does the permitting effectiveness really mean? We all know that there are some significant flaws in our, our permitting system, in particular two bulkheads. Um, rather than jump straight to the compliance and tracking down the illegal structures, which of course we all know are out there, um, we wanted to take a step back and objectively um, review the effectiveness of our existing uh, shoreline bulkhead permitting process and um, whether or not that the conditions that we're applying are really having any impact on the near shore, near shore ecosystem. We're really at that point now in the project where we're uh, selecting uh, which local improvements we want to make. And like I said, we'll be sharing those findings at the end of the year. So next slide, please. So what is TACT? The, pro the title of our, our grant was uh, Near Shore Permitting Effectiveness Through TACT. Um, in this, it's not just something that we all strive for, obviously. But in this case, it's just a nice little acronym. Uh, Troubleshooting, action planning, course correction, and tracking and monitoring. So I'll go through each of these. Next slide. So for the troubleshooting part, um, each agency pulled their bulkhead related permits for a roughly five year period, 2007 to 2012. Um, for Kitsap County, we found that we had 65 uh, permits. 56 of those were repair replacement, nine were new, five were approved. So there's a lot of numbers and data that we've organized around uh, this troubleshooting process. Um, right away, it illuminated some major needs and gaps that we have in our existing process um, for each of the agents. Um, and these are compi compiled in what we call our troubleshooting report. And this will be part of the final project, but we also have a draft of that available. Um, so the gaps we found were categories by issue. Um, either permit forms, the review process itself, uh, recording and tracking, inspections, and then um, outreach as well. So next slide, please. Action planning. We've um, put together what we're calling a report card. It's developed to organize um, those common issues that we found and identify the possible solutions, the estimated effort or uh, cost to implement, and then um, some potential measures of success. Uh, the of the report card, the issues and the possible solutions um, we're reviewed internally amongst our county staff, including the people that intake the permits, the folks that uh, run the permitting system itself, um, planners. We also have um, sent it out for external review by some willing contractors and consultants and advisory groups. So we have some outside eyes looking at um, um, our identified issues right now. Um, this list of actions that we're going to hopefully Im implement this year in 2014 uh, are being refined right now. So this is roughly where we're at in the process. So next slide. Course correction. So this is where we start to implement the actions and this is really where we're starting right now. Um, we'll 
have a report on the progress and results are going to be submitted at the end of the year. And then we're going to be working with some regional coordinating bodies, whether that's the Washington Association of Counties um, or others, to educate and transfer these lessons to other Puget Sound um, jurisdictions that are similar. Tracking and monitoring. So while these other tasks have been going on, we've been working with um, DFW, with Tim Quinn and Phil Dion, um, to um, do this fourth lane, which is tracking and monitoring. Tracking, um, they take that permit data that we had out into the field um, to determine if the current bulkhead permit conditions, both the county and the HPA, HPA are um, effective at being implemented. So we properties owners that were identified in, during the troubleshooting process um, to get permission, which we found a couple things. One, um, as was already mentioned, it's difficult to get permission um, to do this research. And that there were too few uh, new bulkheads to really adequately measure um, if permit conditions were being effective. So the focus shifted uh, largely to the implementation of permit conditions. Um, and this is still ongoing, I believe. So. I'll we'll switch to the next slide, please. So the part that you've all been waiting for, I'm sure, the, um, some of the initial findings um, for potential actions this year. One, um, there's no verification or link in the county's permit system between the HPA from DFW and the county permit. Um, there they use, the county uses parcel ID numbers, whereas DFW does not. Um, even if you're searching by the name or address of the applicant, they don't always match up. And so um, we're working on those consistency, and I know a lot has already been done to um, alleviate that. Um, in addition, the receipt of an HPA is a condition on the local permit, but what we found is that there was no built-in verification process um, via inspections or even a box to check that, um, that it was received or um, prior to that account being finaled or closed out. Um, just an example, we found that only 25 of the 65 permits had verification of an HPA. And that doesn't mean it didn't, it didn't have one, it just means there was no way to, to find a linkage between those. Um, so we're looking into a better way of linking those two permits um, through consistent naming conventions and also through electronic attachment to the permit file um, of associated permits and documents. So another thing we found was because DFW needed to focus on implementation of the permit conditions and the majority were for repairs and replacements, it became abundantly clear that there was a need for permits to document existing conditions um, using fixed landmarks. So what, what happens a lot of the time is they'll say, they're basing the new structure on where the old one was, but when you go out and fill later, there's no way to see where that old structure was. So we need to um, use the fixed landmarks better in the, um, for those repairs and replacements. The other issue, um, when we laid out all the permit info into a matrix format, we noticed a somewhat hodgepodge mix of what was recorded and how, um, the level of documentation. Um, we're going to be looking to develop a standardized checklist for permit reviewers. Um, not only to include the process, but a list of the latest documents and maps to consult during that review um, process. Um, and this will help get all the um, existing planners on board as well as um, help train new, new ones that come in. Um, and then of course the technical assistance. Um, you know, a lot of staff may not have the training to make those technical decisions. And we're hoping that the upcoming Marine Shoreline Design Guidelines from um, DFW uh, and any associated training will be a helpful start with that. Now the issue of bulkhead exemption permits goes well beyond the county purview to completely solve. Um, however, there are some administrative changes that could be considered. Um, the Kinsap County Shoreline Exemption Permit covers everything from access steps down to the beach to these residential bulkheads, meaning they are charged the same amount despite the fact that the bulkhead permits obviously require a lot more uh, review time. Um, so something that could be looked into um, So, okay, let me back up. The fee includes everything from administration to inspections and reviews, so any extra time is billed to the applicant after the fact, and that adds frustratingly unpredictable cost to the permit, um, as well as the administra administration um, costs associated with that. 
So one option that's been discussed is to include a separate bulkhead exemption permit that includes a higher base fee. Um, and that's just one thing that's been thrown out there. And lastly, but not least, the biggest one, I think, um, is the mitigation. Um, a very small percent of permits that are noted to require mitigation um, as a condition, like the planting plans, um, actually had any follow-up info linked to the permit file. Um, it is likely that staff actually did do receive those, but they may have been tracking it separately, um, but it wasn't in the electronic permit system. Um, to that end, we found that mitigation needs to be reported better in the permit system and in a consistent manner. Um, staff do not have the time or funding to follow up on these reports, even if they do get them. Um, all permit fees have already been expended, so there's no time, there's no funding. Um, <coughs> right now at Kids App, one of the options we're looking into is mitigation bonding. Um, to utilize and to utilize an existing postcard notification system that we have in place. So, um, you know, mitigation banks are, are allowed under our, our um, code. However, we don't have mitigation banks in Kansas County. So, looking at fixing that. Any questions? Are you guys uh, uh, assessing how well your system is that loss? Can, can you repeat the question? if our system was looking at um, if we're implementing no net loss. Not specifically. Um, however, I personally have, uh, was a co-manager for our s &P, so it's always in the back of my mind how to do that and how we can fix that into there, so that's something to consider. Actually, uh, cloud construction has been With respect to the exemption issue, have you found, certainly we have in Bellevue, that the term exemption is um, is a loaded term for, for property owners because they expect, expect very little permit process. They expect that because it's an exemption, it's going to be granted, irrespective of the shoreline policies that they apply or, or the s and regulations that they apply. And and it strikes me as incredible that we have not looked at this issue more closely at the legislative level because if, in fact, we really want to do something about bulkheading, we, we desperately need to change the, the free pass that people get for installing bulkheading. And I, I just don't understand why we don't talk about that more. It simply seems to be one of those low-hanging fruit that needs to be grab and change. Now, obviously, the political process is difficult, but, I mean, you do have, um, you've got a new director of ecology, you've got a new governor, it's time to do something about it. A lot of your issues that you have findings on have to do with funding of staff work and the fees that are collected. Have you kind of compared your fees with other jurisdictions to see if they're, I, I just know from personal experience, a lot of jurisdictions have very low fees that simply do not cover costs. And how do yours stack up and do you have plans to fix it? Right, can so, you repeat that? Um, um, Dean was asking how um, the cost of the, the fees compared to other counties. Um, and my understanding is that with Kitsap County, it's um, fairly, the low to moderate range for pricing. Um, yeah, of course, I can't speak too much to that. Any plans to kind of deal with the problem? So we, Kinsan County um, is an entirely fee-based system. Um, our department is entirely reliant on the fees that we collect. So obviously, we have to take a very close look at what um, those fees are covering. So. Well, thank you very much. That was great. And now um, we actually are going to have mics that we're going to circulate around the room so you guys can make your comments. Um, they'll be heard on the live stream and um, and have a dialogue. So I'm very pleased to uh, introduce Annette Fromm, who is Managing Director of Fromm Com, 
and she has um, worked on uh, uh, communications related to water quality in Puget Sound and other Northwest um, environmental issues for over 25 years. And she's here today to help facilitate the discussions that we have so that we can really effectively use folks' time. And, and uh, uh, Nicole is going to be recording your um, top line comments. We have people taking notes. So there will be a report at the end of this um, forum that you guys can all look at, as well as a video that you can uh, review or send to your friends. And again, it is being live streamed, so we do ask that um, you, when you're making your comments that you speak into one of the um, wireless mics, which Claire is going to um, bring to you. Thanks so much. Heather, is this the right slide? Uh, yes, that's the right slide. Can you hear me? Like I said, you'll be right. You have to be right up against this mic. I'm going to eat it for lunch. <laughs> Interesting collection of speakers this morning. I feel like we've gotten insights into some of the challenges with permitting, as well as some of the really interesting work going on to improve how the permit process works and how they're communicating with landowners and with permittees. My first before we get into the open discussion, are there any questions that any of you have that you didn't get a chance to ask or that came up from some other speaker in the process? Did you have any questions? Nicole. I have a question. Is there any way that we could have here who's actually tried out one of the pathways, for example, working with Pierce County and from the applicant's perspective could give feedback of, was that a good idea? Is this something to pursue? Because we are looking for good suggestions and there's always two sides to every story. So anybody have personal experience that they can talk about? Good or bad or lessons learned? Anybody? Yeah. Well, Did you, I, I, uh, I, I want to ask, oh, sorry, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and take a microphone. Oh. And introduce yourself. And introduce yourself. Oh, I, I'm Mike Payne of the city of, uh, from the city of Bellevue. And, uh, we, we have a completely electronic system now. We're taking in permit, electronic permits. Can you guys hear him? I can't hear you. Sorry. Uh, we, have a, we have an electronic permit system now. Um, and we're taking an electronic permit. I, what I, and I think eventually that's going to improve up our level of service and probably for all applicants. I think for many single family applicants with complicated environmental issues, uh, that's it's still going to be problematic. You're not going to you're not going to fix the problem with all these electronic things. There's some uh, additional exchange of information, and I think. Uh, the, the, uh, point that Dennis made is that you do, you at least have the potential to speed up the interaction, and that's important. What he, he didn't talk about, but I know he knows all about, is that the, the funding of the, of the permit pro program is incredibly important. You can't tie fees, or you can't tie all land use actions to fees that people pay. Um, and have it fee supported, because when development falls off, your staff is gone and you have to start over. Uh, some sort of development reserve fund is absolutely essential. And the government agency should pay for the public interaction. So you should split out your, your, uh, your uh, permit center into those actions that are providing information. That should be a general government action and the actual permitting where you're collecting fees. If you don't do something like that, then you consistently lose your staff every time um, that you have a major calamity as we've gone through. The other thing is you need a strong code because you can't, you can't simply try to facilitate development if in fact you don't have a really protective code. That's a difficult political issue and, and many communities around the region are finding that. But you absolutely have to have all of these components. If you're going to facilitate development and you're going to make your clients understand that that's your act, your, that's your general purpose, you are going to try to help them to get what they want, but with the least amount of environmental damage, you absolutely have to have a good code. The other thing I would say is that um, despite all these innovations, if your clients coming in 
absolutely oppose your right to regulate, you're not going to make much progress. And that's kind of the situation we have right now in many communities. And you sit, all the education in the world is not going to help that because they simply deny that you know what you're talking about. Some uh, agencies in the region are simply uh, unable to communicate to, to many of their citizens because they basically don't trust government. So some other mechanism needs to, to be interjected here to help people understand. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> See, this hand went up first. Could you stand up and then see? Yeah, one minute. And then over side. So we'll give you two mics. One back here. That woman in the blue. I know you're waiting for stuff. Yeah, go ahead. Well, she's waiting for the mic. Go for it. All right. And then so I think I think some excellent points were made, especially the development reserve fund. We certainly see that in San Juan County. The recession hit us incredibly hard because we have some really small tax base. But I'm really interested in what percentage do you think in Bellevue are of that really hardcore private property rights? Would you say 5, 10, 15, 20? That's going to put me on the spot. <laughs> but I would say the vast majority of shoreline property owners are. So uh, spe specifically shoreline property The regulated rights. community with, 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 with respect to this issue. So specifically shoreline property owners, you're saying the vast majority. So we're bumping that up to 75%. Pretty close to that. Be my guess. Okay, and that's a group that no matter how much outreach education effort, your feeling is they just are not going to want to hear it. That's been our experience. We're seven years into our SMP and we don't have one. Yeah. I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie. She's got some good things to say about that. Good morning, Stephanie Buckham, the director of Friends in San Juan. And I'm, I'm always challenged by, by the omission of attributing a cost to the cost of litigation. We spend a lot of time in our processes evaluating effectiveness, and I think we need to do some accounting of how much our counties and our state are spending on defending existing laws and regulations. There's also a lot of nonprofits out there, myself included, that get a lot of great care having to fundraise for upholding the laws and regulations of the state of Washington. And I'm frustrated by that. And I bet all of you are too. And so doing a little bit better job when we're um, doing our, our surveys and calculating not just how much shoreline we've lost, but how much money we've spent defending existing laws and regulations. And I just want to make one, one last point. Um, the enforcement cost doesn't come anywhere close to the cost of our prosecuting attorney or the state AG or your Habitat Bio at WBFW, or Hugh Shipman show up as an expert witness, our enforcement dollars don't touch the level of cost when it comes to enforcement. So somewhere, we've got to get a better handle either through our SMP or critical areas, ordinance violations. We just had 40 acres on San Juan Island, the shoreline clear cut on December 16th. Our CAO regulations are so de minimis, they're not captured, but maybe $2,000 worth of the damage, let alone the restoration. So I'm seeing a gap here, and it's about money and how much it costs to, to enforce. And I'm frustrated. Can I ask you to do something then? Because yeah, this is. You're going to take that out. I was just going to do that. Go ahead. So then the question is. Given that there are these problems, what have people done to try to improve the permitting process and try to begin to address some of these problems? The person over by the by the line was kind of hand up. So we we're trying to figure out how. I mean, I, I totally hear these are problems that we deal with the property rights advocates and the lack of funding. 
but what are people doing to try to do something about those things? You know, how are we trying to make the communication work better? How are we trying to make the permit process or the funding process work better? I you know you may not have answered that question, but you had your hand up, so. No, well, actually, <laughs> I don't know if I can answer that question. I want to inspect the funding. Funding is important. And uh, what we have done is uh, we, we did stabilize our funding. We uh, are 100% fee supported for 63% of our staff and 37% is general fund support. So we've actually done the exercise of breaking out enforcement, general information, uh, long range planning, those are all things that are general fund support versus that. And, and we actually have got that approved. I, I consider it also the fact that uh, I've asked, uh, you have to train your council, you've got to have to trust your council. Um, I raised fees 25% uh, the first year, about 15% the second year, um, and about 7% the last year. And I'm trying to train them. That you have to do that every year. You have to do that. And most agencies don't do that. They get behind and they do them on five year, seven year increments. What kind of response have you gotten to the fee increase? What do they say? Uh, basically, there's that. I'm getting, giving them timely and reliable decisions and quality, so I've had unanimous support from the industry. Um, I haven't heard too much talked about um, 
the applicant's view of the fee structure, but I know there's not fees coming in for um, the jurisdictions, but I know some of the frustrations with the permitting process is the fee structure. So one jurisdiction that I'm working with was trying to help lower income families, and they felt kind of based on um, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers has a programmatic we talked about earlier. They did a similar programmatic for their own permitting structure. So I helped develop that for them. And so it helped streamline a certain set of criteria. If the applicant fell within a certain scenario of development, then they could reference this programmatic. And the fee structure was, I think it was about a quarter because the uh, review time is so much less. And um, one thing that had worked with the jurisdiction was it wasn't a one-off. They weren't able to write this one programmatic and then be done with it. It would have to adapt through time. So they just had to make sure that they were willing to update it every year. Yeah. And it's quite a map to our table. Go ahead. Go ahead. Now the guy I'm sorry, I have to cut I think the question of fees is a really important one, and if you think about it, we are asking a, a private property owner to essentially expend funds both for construction and for permitting for a public good. And it, it, is, um, it is unfortunate that the fees are so high, and many communities have uh, very uh, sophisticated permit systems. Bellevue is one of those that if you depart from the, the prescriptive regulations, you have to spend an enormous amount of money on consultants to prove that the departure was scientifically justified. And it seems to me that that's something that the local communities, if in fact we really care about these resources, and the state itself would subsidize to some degree. Because you, if, if, in fact, you're getting somebody to do the right thing, then why should they pay for it? And that's, that's one, of the, one of the real conundrums, I think. Um, we do a lot of fire inspection, for example, for life safety reasons that a particular applicant doesn't spend an enormous sum for. Um, there are other examples at the local government level. The problem is we don't. We, don't, we simply don't fund our local governments at a level that actually allow us to do the work that's required. The state has to do more, or the federal government has to do more, if in fact we really care about these things. Because we simply will never have the money at the local government level. Even in a very wealthy community like Bellevue, there isn't the political will to, to tax the residents to pay for these services. They always are way down a lot at the level of priority. And you know, it, this is one of the obstacles. Somebody may want to do the right thing, but they simply don't want to pay those, those fees. And um, I, I think just recognizing that they are doing the right thing and reducing the fees or eliminating them would make, make a huge uh, difference in the approach people would take. I think one of the problems is Congress, if you haven't noticed, anybody want to fund things either of these days. Right, <laughs> right. Get into that. Did you want to talk to you? You know? I hear your comments and assumption that if the fees were less, people would get permits more. San Juan County had no fees for shoreline structures, and they had crack compliance. So I don't think those two things are combined. I think the point goes back to what Amy said about monitoring, and that if there was a way for jurisdictions to work with the state to monitor, because there's, if you're doing a shoreline structure, you're probably getting three different jurisdictions involved. All three of them are asking providers to jump through a series of hoops, but none of them are funding inspections. And so the most important thing with, that needs to happen, no one is paying for. So in my mind, I would say, dump the Army Corps permit and have them pay for inspections. Well, I mean, I, I, I hear your point. I guess uh, a lot of things So, uh, I don't know where the, 
where it balances it. Um, monitoring is absolutely Local jurisdictions are very cost diverse when it comes to legal action. And um, it, you know, it, it just ends up not working very well. Um, it may be that uh, in, in San Juan County, the, the basically the, the notion that there were no fees created an environment that anything you know, would go. Now when you oppose a fee structure and a permitting structure, the reaction may be a little bit different. I just wanted to say a, a point about saying no. And I think our regulations are at a point, whether you're in San Juan County or Quillam or Kitsap, that it would be very helpful with all of the incredible uh, resource mapping that's been done of feeder bluffs and forage fish spawning beaches. If we as local partners and WDFW and ecology could all come up with agreement that when we have feeder bluffs mapped, those are no-go zones. Where we have documented forage fish spawning beaches, those are no-go zones. So the investment-backed expectation that property owners have is clearly articulated on the same map that all of the permitters are looking at. And that's a real tough thing to say no to your child or to your neighbor. But I think it gets us to a quicker resolution of what that applicant wants sooner rather than later. So I'd really love to see the conversation start to happen with mixed jurisdictions on where are the no-go zones, the absolute no-touch zones. In San Juan County, it's 10 of 410 miles of shoreline. That's not a lot to put a red line on. Any comments with it? Can I ask, uh, again, I want to get information, suggestions, and ideas. So I'm going to pick on you because that's a good start. Anybody in a jurisdiction using something like that, have some mapping because that's one thing I wanted to do is pull us back to the front end. Monitoring, like you all said, is at the back end. So back to the front end where the person comes in to the counter. Who's using some form of priority mapping or whatever? and find that that's a useful technique or trick. Anyone have anything to be able to say about that? Pierce County over here. Yeah. Pierce County, priority mapping. OK, uh, somebody over here. Well, to sort of respond to that suggestion, and perhaps to rain a little bit on the parade, without naming counties, names, jurisdictions, or anything, I think what we're talking about is a will to enforce what our current regulations are. And you know, we you say that it's easy just to say to say no for particular areas, but you were talking also earlier about the legal cost of doing that. And we've got certain geotech resources out there, you know, in our county code that says you need to go and put a geotech, do a geotech report for a specific site. And then when it comes back, the geotech resource says, you're going to lose a house if you don't put a bulkhead here, for sake of argument. Find me a county that's going to uh, have an engineering department that's going to contest that. Because you have a landowner that says, well, that you have to pay for it when my house falls in. So turn that around, because this is what we got to do here. This is not a bitch session. We could, because every single person in this room could bitch about permitting. This well, is not a bitch session. So what I want to do is, for every time, and I'm going to let you, everybody gets one bitch, but every bitch has to come with an and. Here's a suggestion of what we could try, because I saw it or I heard it. You can tell me something that's being done in South America that we haven't tried. I don't care where, but what we're trying to do is 
be forward thinking of here's a thought to address what I really am bitching about because I'm sick and tired of it. That's my only request. Okay, well, here's the suggestion. Okay, for here's that, my good. Thank you. Some outside of the box solution. If you're talking to a landowner that's got 10 acres of property and they've got a house that's within 50 feet of the shoreline on a 50 or 60 foot tall meter bluff, where in the potential codes or in the regulations that we that we use and we say, well, it'll be cheaper just to move your house <laughs> rather than putting up a bulkhead. If they cost $100,000 for a bulkhead, mitigation after the fact, et cetera, et cetera, has anybody come up with alternative solutions that may be as simple as, well, it costs you $40,000 to move the house? But how do we do that? What's a suggestion to how to deal with that? Because we all know those issues. And we can argue that, believe me, we can spend the whole lunch hour, we can go to the end of the day because we've all probably been in those meetings before or arguing about it. What, what are some of the things that can help us? Are there tools? Are there techniques? I mean, technology, one thing I'm hearing is there's technology is helping. Has anybody seen glimmers of light to address that issue that they can suggest? Because I'm all for saying this is a problem, but I'm also all for saying Here's a solution, so or a possible one, because I want to help you. I want to help you. I want to help him. I want to help these guys who are the permitters. That's my job, and I want to find these solutions. So I'm going to be adamant about it because I'm passionate, as you can tell, about this problem. One one idea. This is uh, Kathy Herman from Michigan. I don't know. It seems not to be working. It's but, well, um, one idea that we had talked about um, just based on some workshops for our permitters was to have some sort of either a state or a local um, geotechnical review person that we can call on in these cases. Because right now in the county, we don't have anyone on staff who can do um, an independent review of whether or not that said that bulkhead has to be put in or the house is going to fall in. We don't have um, another way to go about that right now. I don't think it would be that hard if everybody in this room worked with the state to say, okay, we, one way that we can help is we need to provide the information and technical assistance. I mean, it kind of goes back to Amy's presentation kicking off this morning. We need to have the tools to provide local people what they need to be able to make the best decision. If they don't have anywhere to go, they're stuck. So that's one idea. Does that, does that start to get to some of the things? Oh, no. great. All right. The Just woman in the green in the back. Until she gets the microphone, I have another comment. Um, just following up on that last comment, I agree that there has to be a way for the state and the local jurisdictions to combine forces with some of their regulations. For example, there was a project on the Hood Canal where there was an existing boathouse with many creosote pilings out in the water. And um, they were proposing to put it back uh, uh, behind the ordinary high water line about 10 feet. Well, the county jurisdiction said, I'm sorry, you have to be about, I bet this is years ago, I can't remember, something like 25 feet back. and. Um, the Department of Ecology came in and said, I'm sorry, even though uh, these people have this heinous structure in the water with a huge uh, square footage of coverage, upper water coverage, because you're not complying with, we Department of Ecology, because you county are not complying with your regulation, we're going to let the environmentally detrimental structure remain in place. And so, in a similar way where you have to have, if there's a disputed project where there could be some environmental per, uh, environmental benefit, but it's not occurring because it's not exactly your regulations, if there could be some sort of round table of agency folks who can look at specific situations when it doesn't really fit into the square. Um, that would be really helpful both for the environment and for the clients. It's a win-win. So, so 
Would you do that for specific permits or at like a general every now and then? How would you do that? Well, I think when you have situations where environmentally you are keeping the detrimental structure in place when proponents are trying to do the right thing, if if counties and jurisdictions want compliance and they see that people who are trying to do the right thing are getting denied and it's based on uh, disparate regulations, that's where you can kick it. I don't think it would be for every permit at all. I remember, I'm just going to throw one in here. I used to work for the King Local Hazardous Waste Management Program in the county and we created an organization called IRAC which stood for Interagency regulatory something forgotten, it. but it was that was the purpose of it was to bring that bring together the fire department and the solid waste and the water quality and say this is an issue. These are conflicting. Is that the kind of thing you're thinking of? Something yes. like that? Yeah. How many people would be interested in something like that? Would you participate if it was trying to make things streamlined? A handful. Okay. The woman in the back of the green you had something to say. Uh, so.
you know, having to go through this drawn out process and then for whatever reason the structure has issues. So the agencies oh. need to be more open to seeing incremental improvements if it doesn't line up with exactly what you want. So how would you fix that? That's what we're going to try to have the discussion about how would you fix that? Just like I said, look at incremental improvements. Is the project improving habitat in one way or another? And one way is, um, I think that there needs to be an impact and mitigation schedule where you uh, create impact points <laughs> and mitigation points and somehow you come with a balance or an improvement of a project and it can be quantified in that way and not leave it up to a personal project reviewer at an agency level saying this isn't what we want, it's not giving us what we want. If you okay. have something that we can, as permit applicants, say we have a, an impact of 10 points and we have mitigation of 20 points, there's a benefit to the project. Nicole, do you want to talk about the great choice for homes for a second? That's going directly to what you're talking about. No, it's not really. Actually, okay. I was going to ask Steve because Steve was involved in 2009 very actively, and I was just curious what you've <coughs> seen since 2009 that either you've tried or you've noticed has definitely changed because since then, in the process that you're going through. I would say that um, I, I go back to what I uh, asked. Joe earlier is on the, the um, bulkheading issue, or should say a green shoreline issue, where you're submitting at federal level and you think you're within the parameters of their application. You're expecting to see a streamlined process, but it isn't. It still has to go out for consultation with the services. So it would be better, but it's not quite there yet. No. Okay. And one thing that I did notice that is better was um, I recently had an online application with the city of Seattle that um, that saves a huge amount of time. You know, no driving down to Seattle to make an application, no sitting at the counter waiting to get in. You can do this all online. But the downside of it is your, your tracking system is lacking in personal contact. You try and call in to find out how your project is doing, and you can't seem to find who's reviewing it or what level of review it's at when it has to go through multiple departments. So, with Pierce, do you have uh, some personal contact with people in the process of that? The, uh, we don't have personal contact, but actually, the email contact is what's happened. So, then you get an online contact, we send them a thank you back, and it creates a report. And we'll usually say, You're not complete, you missed your water availability letter. We've got a lot of it better, so the response has been electronic, but it's been personal. But there is that communication that yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And now you have someone waiting to talk. Oh, oh here? Another one? No, no. Oh, yeah, sorry. Hi, I'm uh, Diane C. I'm uh, working with our browser. Um, you put a little more like I've been working in the environmental permitting world for quite a number of years, and um, I think uh, I've worked in Oregon as well as Washington some examples in Oregon of streamlining, particularly on things like if you're trying to do the right thing or beauty restoration, where there's been waiving of fees, much more streamlined process. Their model is quite a bit different because they work at the state level only. So they're able to actually work with the board and a bit much more. I mean, basically it's like if we can be in Bruce County or, whoever, or City of Seattle or other, or the state level, and uh, just have kind of a one-stop shop um, you know, uh, online web source where you could say, okay, well, I'm, I'm you know, permitting through the city of your county, but I'm also able to see exactly what I need to submit for the state and also able to see what I, I would need to submit for the, the, uh, the, the feds. And if there was really, um, you know, the Oregon has actually, you know, been moving in that, that way basically by having all the agencies sit down and, and say, okay, how can we make this better? And let's just have a one-stop shop. And it's, uh, I think uh, the system moves along much more quickly. Um, it's a little bit different than Washington. Yeah, 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 it's okay. So over here in the red. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Gail Coburn with the City of Seattle. Um, not, I'm getting permits for my department, so I've worked in putting on the sand workshops years ago. And that. So, a couple things. I'm just trying to stretch my mind. That might be helpful. One of the questions that we're talking about is the science and how are we benefiting the environment. One of the things we did in the city is we put together a document for areas within the city of Seattle where we described the environment, we broke it into watersheds, we described the species, we, dis we determined common projects we did, and then we did an assessment of impacts to each of those species and the environment. And we worked with the federal governments, the Corps and the services, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and NIMS, and the city departments. And we used that document for our Corps of Engineer applications and our Fish and Wildlife applications. And we just submit uh, attached little forms called SNFs. And the document that we're using is actually a Seattle biological evaluation that we update regularly. So we have a cohesive science information instead of each individual or each department getting that science information. And it's actually in a three-ring binder so you can replace pages as the science changes. And if you want to see the document, I put it on the external website so anyone could see it and use it. You'd have to do the process differently. The but the information's there and it's called Seattle Biological Evaluation and you can just Google it. And another thing we have is we have pre-application meetings that we held, hold with the federal government every two months and we invite ecology at some of those, we invite WDFW to some of those, we would invite the tribes but they usually don't come. So we have them in a field visit. And we have invited the ORA, the DAP, whoever we need to do, the US Coast Guard, to do a coordinated before we submit our application. Excellent. Thank you very much. OK, I think we have room for like maybe one more. In the back, Joe. Wait, hang on. Hang on. I, I guess it's just more an observation discussion, okay, I think it's helpful, but um, it seems like, you know, we're, we're talking about um, a wide range of activities, um, whether it's a shoreline permitting or um, bulkhead replacement or dock replacement. So, you know, it seems to me that efficiency comes through uh, identifying different activities and maybe a sort of a, a cross-cutting principle is that there's assessment. So if you're going to go with uh, a more programmatic approach, like I think Steve suggested, or like the City of Seattle is doing, that there's that pre-assessment that is the basis for that programmatic. Um, everybody might, might not fit in the box, but at least it hopefully captures the, um, the types of activities you're worried about. Um, and then, um, let's see, lost my train. I guess that's the main point, and you know, just understanding that there's no, you know, that uh, analysis or assessment is a prerequisite to sort of finding efficiencies in the process. Excellent, thank you. All right, so for those of you who have other comments, questions, or thoughts, there's a lunch hour coming up ahead for you to talk to your other patrons about it. <laughs> so um, let me give you the the lunch. Um, so we have 15 minutes for you to pick up your lunch and um, actually if you guys can underneath that table there pull out the cooler so we have drinks for everybody um, sodas um, and there's also of course the, the water and, um, and coffee and tea over here for everyone if you have a lunch ticket um, you'll need to go out and up the stairs or up the elevator to the second floor and around to a room grab your food and please get a lot and then um, bring it back here and get your drink we'll be doing dessert at the afternoon break and we have um, Daryl Williams, who is your lunch speaker. So please come back here to um, have, so we'll have his presentation, then we'll have a little bit of time for you to network before we have our after uh, lunch program. So please, um, if you can, go quickly upstairs, grab your food, and we also have, um, and yeah, go check your car, of course. And we have more lunches available if you want to buy
deadline to come to the registration table. Thank you.
seat, that'd be great. So I'm very, very pleased to introduce Daryl Williams, who's with the Tulalips Tribe. Um, he has been an environmental and tribal leader for a long time, but I have recently um, been serving with him on a committee, and I learned that he's in fact doing a biodigester on your farm, if I'm saying that correctly. So that may be something you guys want to hear about uh, later after we talk about this, um, this talk right now. Um, anyway, so the, the plan is to have about a 30-minute presentation by Daryl, and then a short Q&A, um, up to 15 minutes, and then that'll give 15 minutes for everybody to have some more networking time, use the restroom, move your car, and then we're going to have the 30-minute cross-communication piece. So this, that's how we're kind of mapped out this hour um, that's coming up. And thank you so much, Joe, for coming. Good afternoon, everybody. How did you like that Super Bowl game yesterday? Uh, great outcome. Great beginning. <laughs> yeah, that game was great all the way through. But uh, anyway, yeah, I, I am an environmental liaison with the Toilet Tribes, and uh, I'm also the president of Qualcomm Energy with the uh, biogas project. Uh, but uh, that's not what I'm here to talk about. Uh, <laughs> I was asked to talk about the Northwest Indian Fish Commission's uh, Treaty Rights of Risk Initiative, uh, which is a process that was started by the tribes of Western Washington to, to really try to do a better job of uh, protecting uh, our fisheries and the ability of the tribal fishermen to fish. But, Go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so, uh, anyway, just as a brief introduction, uh, I'll start out by talking about uh, kind of why the treaties exist, <coughs> talk about what they are a little bit, but then get into some habitat issues, and then, and, and then talk about the tree rights and risk initiative itself. So, uh, next slide. Uh, you know, as sovereign nations, before the treaties were negotiated with the United States, the tribes had total jurisdiction of the area. Uh, the tribes were the land managers. Uh, really, the only ones fishing at the time were the tribal members. Uh, as European settlers came over, uh, moving into the area, uh, we started to have some conflicts. But by that time, uh, back east, so people were already getting tired of the Indian Wars, and courts were starting to recognize that you know, when people are living someplace, you just can't take their land and call it yours. So the federal government really need to, needed to look at doing something else, and which is really what the very first Europeans did when they came to this country. Some of the earliest uh, treaties with tribes were in the Northeast. But uh, somewhere along the line, the United States decided that, why do we need to do treaties? We can just take it. But by the time they got here, you know, they really didn't want to do that anymore. Uh, losing too many lives and needless wars. But, uh, so uh, Governor Isaac Stevens, who was the governor of the Oregon Territory at the time, asked the uh, president for permission to start negotiating treaties throughout the Northwest. And he negotiated treaties in Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Western Montana. The treaty, or all those treaties are very similar to each other. And uh, they all have one thing in common. That they reserve the rights for the tribes to harvest fish, to hunt, and to gather their traditional roots and berries that they use for foods and for medicines, and for craft work, uh, or the artwork the tribes did. Uh, you know, from the screen here, I put up uh, Article 5 in the Treaty of Point Elliot, which is the treaty for this area. And uh, you know, that's the language that reserved all those rights. And then as time went on, there were a number of uh, issues or court battles that came up to implement those rights. And, uh, 
kind of a little picture from the canoe journey uh, here a few years ago. But, uh, next slide. Um, uh, the colors don't show up in this map very well, but this map shows the, uh, the treaty areas within the state of Washington. In western Washington, there are five treaty areas. So when you talk about the treaties, it's not just one treaty for all the tribes. There are several of them in different regions. Go ahead and go to the next slide. And this is a, and really, coming out of these treaties, the first court case was back in uh, 1905 with the Wainings case, talking about just getting access to our fishing areas. The treaty right doesn't really do us any good if we can't get to the areas where we fish. And uh, this case had to do with the Yakima tribes, our tribal member that was denied access to his traditional fishing grounds on the Columbia River. Um, the, the private property owners were trying to prevent him from crossing their property in order to get to the spot on the river where he normally fished. And the U.S. Supreme Court said he has that right. The treaty guarantees him the right to be able to access his fishing grounds as well as the right to harvest. Uh, so the next big case was 1942 in Tulip. Uh, state of Washington was trying to force tribal members to obtain state fishing licenses in order to go fishing. But again, the court said that if our, the state didn't have the right to intervene on a tribal treaty right. Tribes had the right to manage their own fisheries. So, uh, Thule, or in the Thule case, they were saying that the state really didn't have the right to impose their licensing on tribal members that had the treaty right to go out there and fish. And there were a, a bunch of other court cases throughout the 50s and 60s, but they all kind of got rolled up into the big U.S. v. Washington case known as the Bolt decision and that came out in 1974. You know, people were complaining about a lot of things in that decision that Judge Bolt laid out, but really a lot of those decisions came out of the earlier court cases and, and he bundled them all together. When the tribes filed the U.S.B. Washington case, they really tried to roll up a, a bunch of fishing issues into one case. Uh, but Judge Bolt said this is too much to handle, so he really narrowed the scope down to talk about the harvest issues only for the initial proceeding. And then there's really only about uh, the harvest issues concerning, uh, concerning uh, wild fish, as the hatchery fish came in a later proceeding of the case. So there were a number of things that, that were delayed till, you know, for further judicial review. But Judge Bolt did reaffirm the fact that the tribes didn't have the right to manage their own fisheries. And the big thing was they also had the right to harvest up to 50% of the harvestable fish. And I stress harvestable fish because it's not all the fish. It's when, the, when the salmon return to head up to spawn, you have to allow a certain number of fish to maintain the species. So as the state and tribal harvest managers manage the fisheries. They have escapement goals for each and every watershed in the state. And as we manage the fisheries, you know, we use uh, pre-season estimates to kind of set aside an allocation to each side as to how many fish they can actually harvest and still allow those fish up river to spawn. And, uh, for a while there, our estimates were doing pretty good. You know, more recent years, the estimates aren't, are, haven't been as good, but we also do in-season updates to really look at the strength of the runs as they're coming back, and then we modify our regulations through the season as we refine the numbers, or the estimates as to how many fish we think are out there. And you know, basically, that's a simplified view of how we manage our fishery but the state and the tribes split evenly the harvestable portion. Uh, and, uh, yeah, the, the next real 
uh, sub proceeding that came out of that case was the Habitat case, which uh, Judge Oreck initially decided back in 1979. Uh, and said without the uh, right to uh, protect the habitat for fish, the right to harvest fish would be moved. So, uh, and uh, clearly stated that the tribes did have the right to protect habitat. That decision was then appealed, and an appeal at the court actually reversed that decision, but then it was the tribes appealed that, and the courts came back and kind of reinstated the original decision in part, but then told the tribes to come back with a more specific case to really try to identify what the remedy is that the tribes need. The court, the appellate court, didn't want to just give a broad, uh, uh, make a broad statement of how habitat is to be protected. They wanted to look at different types of habitat or different habitat issues on a case-by-case -case basis, which is why we more recently brought up the, or had the Colbert decision. <coughs> we wanted to really pick something that would open up a lot of habitat if these blocking culverts were fixed. And something that was very specific to meet what the court asked for back in 1979 and 1980. So when uh, Judge Martinez made his decision, he looked at those original decisions and uh, he gave his opinion fairly quickly uh, based on the earlier decisions by the uh, appealing courts. But then it took a few years working out the remedy portion, which was finally uh, settled last year. And uh, the state of Washington is appealing that, but in the meantime, they have started implementing what the judge ordered. So they didn't ask for a stay of his order, but they, while they uh, go through the appeal process. And uh, that case, uh, actually allows the Department of Transportation up to 17 years to fix all their blocking culverts, or the, the key ones anyway, that block salmon passage. Uh, it also affects uh, the other state agencies, but the other state agencies had already been working on it. They're only a few years away from completing the repair of their blocking culverts, so it's not as big of an issue for DNR, Department of Fish and Wildlife, and state parks. And uh, DNR was actually doing theirs under the uh, Forest and Fish Agreement and had been working on it ever since that agreement was finalized. So uh, I think they're only about three or four years from completing uh, their repairs of their uh, blocking culverts. Uh, one other case I skipped was the shellfish case. Uh, Judge has also said that a fish is a fish. It doesn't matter what type of fish or shellfish it is, it's still a fish. And the treaty right is there for all types of fish, not just salmon. And, uh, I didn't put the uh, case up there involving hatchery fish, but one of the things the courts looked at for that case was the fact that really the reason we have, or the state of Washington had hatcheries and why the federal government had hatcheries was to mitigate for habitat damages that were caused by building of dams, by different types of development that occurred in the state. So uh, they were really, through the different types of development, taking fish away from the tribe. So this was a way of getting fish back to not only the non-tribal fishermen, but the tribal fishermen too. So the same 50-50 split for wild fish also applies to hatchery fish. Next slide. Just a, an old photo of uh, fishermen fishing. I'm not sure when this one was taken, but since it's a black and white, it was probably quite a while ago. Next slide. And of course, you know, today we're dealing with a wide variety of, of habitat problems. Um, a lot of them are, <coughs> are water quality issues. I tried to narrow this thing down to more the, the marine shoreline issues. As everyone knows, we got bacteria runoff from uh, farms and from uh, failing septic systems. We 
have uh, chemical and oil chem contamination from uh, treated filings and bulkheads, docks, and then chemical spills and oil spills from our from all the shipping that occurs within Puget Sound. Uh, Endocrine disruptors is uh, an emerging issue. Uh, it's like uh, probably been 10 years now, I guess, since the first uh, research started showing issues with uh, endocrine disruptors affecting this, the sex of juvenile fish. Where, uh, because of all the drugs that we use that uh, end up um, exiting out of our wastewater treatment systems, those chemicals are affecting the fish and blocking their endocrine system so you get uh, you know, 80 or 90 percent of the juveniles that are living in the water directly affected by those that are all one sex. And you just can't repopulate species when you have fish that are almost all one sex. So that's something that we need to uh, address uh, a little better as we move on. And I know uh, wastewater treatment operating our system operators are looking at ways that they can try to deal with that issue. Uh, EPA's been looking at ways of dealing with it. So as the Department of Ecology and, and a number of other organizations, including the tribes. Uh, yeah, nutrient loading you know, from nutrients running off the <coughs> land and landscaping efforts, uh, people's lawns and gardens. Sedimentation, which primarily from uh, forestry activities and new construction work. And uh, of course, stormwater runoff, which is something that uh, you know, we still need to do a better job of managing. There are much better ways of treating stormwater than what we've been doing. And our, of course, the current requires for stormwater treatment are only for the high population areas. We're really not doing much of anything to control stormwater out in the rural areas something I think we need to do a better job of addressing. Um, later on the screen, I can't really read the <laughs> issues for the habitat. Bulkheads and uh, dredging are the first two there. Yeah, but with the bulkheads, dredging, uh, and uh, the other things that are up there. <laughs> so I forgot what I put on the list. It's it's on that. <laughs> passable barriers to estuaries and tributaries. Yeah, but you know, with the new developments and, and things that we do to try to protect the older developments, we are modifying our habitat. Yeah. You know, with the bulkheads, we're causing the beaches to erode away faster. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, with the loss of uh, eel grass, we're losing the habitat that's needed for some of our forage fish. And, and with the loss of our wetlands, we're losing some of the feeding areas for our juveniles, um, say with the pocket estuaries. Uh, you know, some of our salmon migrate out of the main river systems and head out towards the ocean. They're ducking up into the lower parts of the various streams that flow directly into Puget Sound as a, for an area to feed in on their way out. And well, we've blocked off a lot of those uh, tributaries to where they don't have access anymore, uh, especially along the rail lines. You know, in this county, probably over half our shoreline has the rail line right next to it. Uh, well, that's uh, heavily rip wrapped to help protect the rail line, but the culverts underneath those rail lines are oftentimes uh, barriers for fish migration. But we've lost a lot of habitat in our Puget Sound area, as well as upriver. And it's, we're doing things to kind of recap these areas, to reconstruct them. But as we keep allowing new development, we're still destroying habitat faster than we're recreating it. So every year, the, uh, the amount of habitat we have continues to decline. And until we do a better job of protecting what we've got, that's not going to change. It's still going to keep declining. So we really need to do a better job of protecting what we still have, as well as restoring it to try to improve habitat so we can start building. Uh, next slide. The other thing that impacts tribes is just the interference to the right to fish. As we build new docks, put up mooring buoys, 
uh, the shipping traffic increases. These are all things that impact the tribe's ability to actually go out there and fish. I've been uh, participating recently with the uh, Puget Sound uh, Harbor Safety Committee and looking at the uh, vessel safety throughout. And uh, George Washington University just created a new model for them showing shipping traffic. And you know, they were trying to look at how the increases in shipping traffic with the proposed new ports in the area would have, or what kind of effect that could have for increase in oil spills and other types of incidents. But when one person looked at the model showing the, the vessel movements and saying how much area was taken up by shipping traffic, uh, they asked one of us, uh, how do you guys fish with that much vessel traffic out there? <laughs> but between all that shipping traffic and everything else that's going on in Puget Sound, we just don't have gill netters can extend their nets in anymore. So, you know, tribes have to look at all those issues. Uh, next slide. So, uh, you know, the Treaty Rights at, at Risk Initiative is something the tribes created uh, back in 2011 to try to address a lot of these issues. Uh, we went to the federal agencies and basically told them they weren't doing their job. So what are they going to do about it? The Council for Environmental Quality in the White House has been assigned to take a federal lead on uh, developing a multi-agency response. And uh, you know, they've been working on that uh, for about two and a half years now. And still haven't come up with a very good answer. And, uh, you know, it's something that the tribes are pushing hard on. Uh, some federal agencies are doing better than others, but we need all the federal agencies to step up to the plate and and take responsibility for the actions that they're responsible for. And, and unfortunately, without the push from the federal level, I don't think we're going to get much more out of the state level either until you know, the people of this state are willing to really put the pressure on their legislators to say that we want to recover our fisheries uh, right now. And we don't have that strong political pull amongst the the people who actually vote our, our legislators into office. And until we do, you know, we'll get some slow changes for the better, but we really need to develop the, uh, the public attention and really get them to understand what the issues are. Because we really don't have strong enough support in the legislature to, to get the laws changed to allow the agencies to really do their jobs. Notice a lot of times when the agencies do really step up and try to do something, the legislature pushes back. And we have to stop that pushback from the legislature and give the agencies the support they need to do their jobs. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is just a photo from one of our salmon ceremonies. And, uh, next. And with that, I'll take questions. Uh, we've got the web address on the board here for the Treaty Rights at Risk website. It's managed by the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission and it has a lot of information, including a copy of this white paper that's on there that really talks about what the issues are that the tribes are concerned about. And uh, I think it would be useful for many of you to take a look at this document and see what it says. Uh, uh, so, can you repeat their questions once they ask your question? Yeah. The expenses treated in 1855 and also, what's the harvest for the tribe over the years? Has it been decreasing? And that's what the concern is? Is it the, you know, has your take of the 50% decreased over time? Yeah. Can, can you repeat that? Yeah. Uh, we asked uh, about the treaties of 1855 and how the, has the tribal harvest been declining? Definitely it has. In the treaties of 1855 were the Stevens treaties, which was 54 and 55, uh, most of them in this area, 55. <coughs> but uh, yeah, those treaties are what really reserved the tribe's rights to harvest. 
and they say reserved rights because I said before uh, before the treaties the tribes had full management control of the territory. After the treaties, uh, the tribes still had rights for certain things. Uh, it's, uh, the way the courts look at it, the tribes only gave up what they specifically gave up, and they. Had, and even where they did give up land and stuff, they reserved certain rights for themselves. And th that reservation of right is something that the tribes still get to control and manage. So uh, whether you're talking about treaty reserved rights or sovereign rights of the tribe as a sovereign government, uh, those, are, those are things the tribe still has the right to manage themselves. By the way, the fisheries, they've been declining steadily since the, I mean, their early 1990s is when they really started taking a drastic drop. And primarily what the, most of the tribes and non-tribal fishermen as well are fishing on is the hatchery production. Uh, we've really minimized our harvest on wild fish because there just aren't enough of them out there anymore, particularly with the Chinook and Steelhead, but where we really don't have a targeted harvest at all anymore. But uh, even with the coho and the chum, and all, well, the canal chum are ESA listed species too. But uh, the Puget Sound chum and coho, those populations have been declining. The sockeye populations have been declining. Even though we did have a real good year a couple of years ago, that's, I don't think anyone understands why we had that good of a year on sockeye that year. Uh, this last year was terrible. Uh, we didn't have a fishery on the on the sockeye at all for its lay level. But uh, it's primarily the hatchery stocks that we're harvesting now. Uh, our numbers are just greatly reduced from what we were harvesting 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, I remember when, when uh, I was working on tri-counties, the tri-county uh, yeah. issue, and um, I always felt we were talking at cross-purposes. In other words, the Local governments were trying to respond to the federal requirement that we do something about threatened and endangered species. And on the other, on the other hand, the tribes were talking about a much more expansive, let's have harvestable fish. And it seems like that, that goal of har harvestable fish in the Puget Sound has been lost, and I hear less and less about it every year. I mean, it's almost as if um, the federal government is working to preserve the endangered species at, at this very low, you know, survivable species level, and we're not talking about harvestable fish. Is that is that your perception, or where do you where do you see your, uh, the tribe's position? Can you repeat that? I well, was asking about the tribal position on salmon recovery. It's uh, under ESA. Uh, uh, ESA, you just have to recover to maintain the species, whereas with the tribe's treaty rights, you need to recover for harvestable rights. And I believe most of the salmon recovery plans around Puget Sound are designed for harvestable numbers. Uh, some do a better job than others. Uh, for the Stohomish River plan, which, which I most familiar with, uh, that plan is aiming for 80% of the historical production of the system. And uh, so that definitely gets us into the harvestable rate trial and just maintain museum pieces. Uh, so and that's one of the places where we've been battling it out with NOAA because they argue that the only legal responsibility they have is under the different acts that the federal government has adopted. And with ESA, they don't have to restore areas to the abundance that the tribes need under the treaty rights. But they have to remember that as federal trustees for the tribes, they have a right to, or they have a legal mandate to, to maintain the treaty rights for the tribes. But a lot of the federal agencies don't really get a grasp of what that means and don't know how to do it. And so they tend to stick to just the laws that have been adopted that they understand. So we need to do a better job of educating them as well as others about what, what those treaty rights mean and what the federal responsibilities are. Mm -hmm. There 
there's a question as to why a few years back they clubbed dead 6,000 Chinook salmon on the Wenatchee River because they were hatchery salmon. And I'm, I'm not understanding the concept here. You know, you're saying salmon production is down in, in uh, native grounds and the <coughs> hatchery fish. Shouldn't we be doing everything that we can to increase productivity in the hatchery or natural world? Can you repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> so he was asking about the decline in fisheries, why they were uh, clubbing some fish to death of the Wenatchee, or hatchery fish to death of the Wenatchee River, rather than letting them go upstream to spawn. And uh, I, I'm not a biologist either, and uh, I don't really know the Wenatchee system that well, but there are concerns about uh, how hatchery fish mingling with wild fish can affect the genetics. And, but it would take uh, someone who knows a lot more about fish biology than me to explain that. Uh, but the, in a lot of areas, we do try to limit the amount of hatchery fish that are intermingling with the wild fish. So my question is, um, getting at the issue of the 50% hatch of the uh, I know that you know the agent, the federal and state agencies do counts, but I'm wondering what, um, how much you guys do of a double check on their numbers and what resources you have to actually do your own independent. How how certain are you of the counts? Is what I'm kind of getting at. <laughs> Can you repeat that? Okay, she was asking about how certain we are about the fish counts for uh, presuming the, the fish that are counted as they they're laying their spawning reds and also maybe the juvenile fish counts. And it's not so much that the tribes double check what the state of Washington is doing in those surveys, but the tribes are also doing those surveys. And we kind of split areas for doing the surveys. So uh, the streams that the state of Washington is doing surveys on, we're not necessarily doing. And the streams that we're doing surveys on, they're not necessarily doing. So that we're actually getting counts in more areas and, and really trying to make better use of our staff time by covering more areas rather than duplicating efforts. But uh, the tribes do spawner surveys and spolt out, out migration studies and a number of others to try to help estimate the production that's coming out of the river systems that goes into our, uh, our harvest uh, models for estimating how many fish are coming back. So uh, I think the state and the tribes actually work pretty well together in that area. In the back. So the reason we all were here today is talking about permitting efficiency, and this may be hard to get at, but so and I know it's government to government, and it's usually the Corps of Engineers with the tribes. What are there suggestions or thoughts you have about tribal in, inter, intersection or involvement where we're talking about single-family residential permitting? Uh,
trying to implement what their uh, county or city commissioners want. And, and uh, <coughs> again, for the state agencies, implementing what the legislature wants. And sometimes they just don't match up very well and they have a hard time working together. Uh, and I think the biggest delay on a lot of these shoreline permits is coming from the federal level. <coughs> Army Corps of Engineers is rather slow with their permitting process, but uh, we do have the joint agency uh, system, our process for reviewing permits, which I think has helped to speed things up and, uh, since that process has been developed. But every agency still has to make sure that they're implementing the rules that they're responsible for, and that takes time. And if you're a small jurisdiction with that much staff, it's hard to do that in a timely manner. Okay. Well, thank you very much. So um, we have, uh, we're going to reconvene exactly at 1 o'clock. Um, there's some of the food from upstairs that's been brought downstairs. So if you uh, are still hungry or if you didn't buy lunch, you can have other food too. Daryl has to go to Olympia. Um, and um, so stretch your legs, deal with your car and the parking, don't forget about that. And
I'm going to keep moving us along because you only have 30 minutes and if I can have your attention, in the next 30 minutes, you have your opportunity. How many people know what a Pecha Kucha is? Where you have like four minutes and you have to talk and you can't stop talking until you're done. All right, what we're trying to do, again, the three, three important aspects of these forums. One is inform you of what's going on. Number two, get you to start talking to one another. One another. And number three is to make sure that we are moving ideas forward. So we started this morning and again this afternoon we're going to be talking about what's some of the new ideas that are going on. Right now we want to know what are you doing and how can you let other people know what you're doing and then maybe hopefully, we hope, walk away from here with information about what's going on. So three minutes, and we're going to time you. So I'm going to start first with three minutes, and I'm going to even set the timer, and I'm going to give you less than three minutes, hopefully, on something I'm working on. If you have something you want to talk about, just come up. We're going to probably just have you line up kind of in a line and just go through. So hold on here. Let me get my timer going. OK. All right, I'm going to talk to you about Green Shores for Homes, and that program, which is coming up with a voluntary certification for single family homeowners. We are at the stage now where we're going to pilot projects starting uh, at the end of this month. We've got a couple of properties in Kirkland and we also have a couple in San Juan Island and we're going to test our credits. So we basically broke it down to the five different categories and we have credits and you assign the credits. What ultimately will happen is the local governments can adopt this program and people can voluntarily say, we want to be part of Green Shores for Homes. We want to get credits for doing certain things on our property. And then at the end of the day, it will help with the permitting process. We're also looking at the incentives, the ideas of whether tax credits or whatever else that you might want, that we might have to go with that and permit expediting, et cetera. So keep, stay tuned, but that's where we are with Green Shores for Homes. Number two, technical assistance to homeowners. Scotty in the back. Wave your hand, Scotty. And I are working on a models for technical assistance for homeowners. At some point, we hope for all of you who've been mentioning this, there's going to be technical assistance for local governments. And we're looking at models so that we can say, there's a, this is a way that this might work at a reach to provide regional assistance to the homeowners. And then the next step will be trying to figure out how to fund something like that. I wanted you to know that that's in the works. Number three, uh, is Mateo still here? No. Anyway, so Mateo and I are also working on a project on the East, uh, the public benefit rating system. Whoever it was, and I can't remember whether that was Joe, we are trying to look at what modifications to the public benefit rating system, both um, those that have PBRS programs and those that have uh, don't have them. And we're looking to see whether or not there are ways to implement and improve the existing PBRS programs so it, they can be tied to conservation easements, et cetera, so that they're long-term and that they will actually provide real tax incentive along with other things. It's not a standalone, but it's one piece of the puzzle. So that's my update. And I only was two minutes and 11 seconds. Okay, Randy, oh, sorry, Tim's next, because he's got to go. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, thank you, Randy. Say your name and where you're from. Uh, my name is Timothy Quinn, and I'm with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, native Northwesterner, born and raised in Seattle. Uh, I wanted to take you back to my time when I was prenatal. It was really dark. Uh, three minutes. So here's the deal. I got two things I wanted to report out on. One of them is you heard this this morning, and that was that we are looking for partners, local jurisdictions, that want to partner on, uh, on, on help trying to develop monitoring plans for their CAOs or shoreline or growth management activities. The, the product that we will bring to the partnership is this change map that will, will document changes over a period of three years, very small resolution changes that would allow you to ask questions about how you're doing on your riparian buffers, on your shoreline master plans, wetland buffers and the like. <clears throat> the second piece of news, and again, um, uh, the web page was up there uh, earlier. Uh, you can contact me directly in Olympia um, or any other number of, of folks from the department here. 
The second thing I just wanted to update you on is the Department of Fish and Wildlife for the first time after about 60 years has developed a programmatic compliance and monitoring program for their hydraulic permit authority. It's starting very modestly and very small. We have 19 different categories of HPAs or permits that we give out. We have identified the two most important permits from, a, from the standpoint of, of current pressures and what we think are uh, potential for stress to the environment. One of them is marine nearshore armoring and the other is um, uh, water crossing structures, uh, particularly water crossing structures on fish bearing streams. So we're starting small, but again, if that's something that your ju local jurisdiction um, is interested in, and the potential for partnerships where you do compliance or effectiveness monitoring on your own permits, while we do them on our permits, you can contact me, okay? Thanks. Oh. <laughs> I'm Randy Carmen. I'm also from the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Can you really run? honored can you to. Get, can you pull the mic way up to you? For the people online. For the people online. Here we go. I'm Randy Carmen with the Department of Fish and Wildlife also. And uh, Tim is my mentor, by the way. <laughs> and I'm here to talk just quickly about. Uh, last Salish Sea Forum we had, I gave a presentation on marine shoreline design guidelines, so a lot of you know what that is. For those of you that don't, it's a document intended to inform people about softer alternatives for marine shorelines, how to do them, how to evaluate sites, all of that stuff we've been waiting for for a while to be compiled because there's various information sources out there. Now we have one document with about 24 case studies included in that. It's fairly dense, it's over a 300 page document. So if you want details, you can get them. Um, the good news is, as I promised the last time I talked about this, we do have the document in hand by the end of last month. So um, there's a little bit of work still to do. We have to review the document, but the good news is we do have it from the consultant in its completed form and would expect that we might need four weeks or roughly thereabouts to get that reviewed and get it onto our website. When we do get it onto our website, you can simply go to WDFW Aquatic Habitat Guidelines. We have other guidelines on there for other types of projects. That's where the document will be located eventually. Um, I should also give credit to EPA for funding our lead organization, Nearshore Group. That's where the funding came from for this. It was actually quite an expensive undertaking because it entailed a lot of field work as well as a lot of analysis of information. Um, the other thing is we're planning on doing a couple of training sessions. Those probably won't take place until maybe mid-March. And we're planning to do one kind of in the North Sound area, who knows, maybe Edmonds, um, and one more towards South Sound to facilitate ease of uh, access by people who want to attend those. So we'll have notices out when we get those uh, kind of lined up and let you know ahead, well ahead of time when those trainings are where they will be. So thank you. Hi, um, my name's Mike Levine and I'm with Marine Surveys and Assessments. Uh, we're a consultant and I just wanted to speak from our side for a second, and I think I can do it in under two minutes. All right. <laughs> so I just wanted to put in a plug for the programmatic assessments um, from our end on helping with the permits. Those are really helpful. Where we run into problems is many of the counties want a completely different report provided for essentially the same project, and that takes a lot of time and review on their end, I can only assume, that uh, the time could then be freed up if they use programmatic assessments more on the uh, mitigation and monitoring end, which I think we've all seen today is, is a big lacking spot on following up on these. And if we could simplify it to where those programmatic assessments were often accepted at the county level, uh, I'll use the concrete example of pier ramp and floats. We, we have one that the core produces and most of the counties essentially ask for the same information in a completely different format, which just, creates an inefficiency on, on all of our ends, and maybe the time that could be saved by making that more efficient could be put towards more monitoring and more mitigation. And that, so I just wanted to put a little plug in on the permitting end uh, and assisting people in the permitting for the programmatic assessments. Thank you.
My name is Jim Weber. I'm with the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission. Uh, commission staff are working with a subcommittee of the Salmon Recovery Council. This particular subcommittee is the Regulatory Gap Subcommittee, I guess they call themselves. And what they're doing is they're looking into uh, regulatory gaps that are thought to be uh, obstacles to salmon recovery. What we're initially looking at first is shoreline armory. And uh, as I'm discovering, as most of you already known for quite some time, is it's a pretty complicated issue. It's not simply, oh, gee, there's an exemption in the Shoreline Management Act, that means there's no regulation. Instead, there's, as we've been discussing, quite the elaborate process. Uh, we're trying to figure out how that works, maybe which approaches people are finding work best. We're trying to develop an understanding of how agencies most effectively deal with shoreline armoring in a way that uh, protects land, but also uh, uh, protects fish habitat as best as possible. And we're also very curious as to how jurisdictions are implementing the no net loss obligation. And so we'd be very interested in hearing what people think about what appears to be wor working best for them, where key pitfalls are, that sort of thing. But you're helping me. Thank you. Hi, I'm Paul Cianu with the Washington Department of Ecology, and I'm going to give an update on uh, my project, which I presented at, at the last forum. But for those of you who don't know, I'm working on soft shoreline stabilization guidance for shoreline master program planning and implementation. And this involves guidance on uh, soft stabilization management policy intent, as well as planning and permitting topics. And it's been going really well, and I've actually had review and input from several people in this room, and I thank you for that. And I'm hoping to have this out probably in March for that type of date. So thanks. I'll take the time she didn't use. <laughs> My name is Michael Murphy. I work for the King County Department of Natural Resources and Parks. Um, I want to give an update on two programs that I work on. Um, well, I work on, on several different things. I'm going to talk about the in lieu fee program a little bit later in the agenda, but right now I want to update you on the transfer of development rights program that we run at King County. This is a program whereby um, rural resource landowners can voluntarily transfer unused development potential from their property and sell those development credits to urban landowners who can create more compact communities in urban spaces. Um, this is relevant to the permitting discussion because one of the provisions in the TDR code, the Transfer of Development Rights Code, is that even if a piece of property is protected by critical areas or, um, ordinances or critical areas rules and regulations, such as a wetland or a shoreline or a steep slope, um, do, landowners can still transfer development um, from that property acreage away from their away from their properties. So it acts as an incentive program for property owners to protect some of the last best places that we have rather than trying to go through the permitting process to ultimately get that property developed. So um, find me and talk to me more about the transfer of development rights program if you want to hear about that. The second thing I'll share is um, a uh, pilot program in the works for Lake Washington and Lake Sammamish talking with uh, various regulatory agencies about setting up a system whereby a um, project proponent doing a replacement or maintenance project on a dock or a bulkhead or other shoreline activity could, um, in lieu of doing their own on-site conservation measure, and I specifically didn't use the word mitigation, um, if, if the services are requiring for them to offset their impacts in, in some way, setting up a system whereby um, the services could direct those property owners to pay money into a fund managed by King County. King County would then use that fund to implement habitat restoration projects in the Lake Washington and Lake Sammamish systems according to the RIA plan, the Salmon Recovery Plan. So that's all for now. Thanks. Are you going to need two minutes? All right. You have 45 seconds? <laughs> Any more? Anybody else? There's got to be some other interesting stuff going on out here. The goal is to learn from other projects that people are working on about what you can do. What we need to do. Anybody else? We can go ahead of schedule. No, I'm just checking. Let's make sure we've got things.
Going, going, going. Don't be shy. This is really this don't opportunity. I really want to hear. Projects, manuals, a problem that you had that you found an innovative way to solve it or didn't. <laughs> Sorry, I'm late. Uh, Mike Grady with the NOAA Fisheries uh, out of Sandpoint. And, and, have you already given your time? Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Fisher will be speaking here uh, shortly. That's why I drove all the way up here. Um, no, hey, the reason I thought I would put in a plug here while we have open mic time, um, not too much my name is Mike, and everybody that works for me is named Mike, by the way. It's <laughs> a weird world. Um, <clears throat> As Jeff will speak to here shortly, we have a uh, tendency of telling people what to do. And um, we like to joke that uh, we're the no part of Noah. But <coughs> um, <laughs> ser seriously, um, you know, when we work at Federal Highways, we work with the Corps and a bunch of other agencies, and we try to green up the shoreline. We've worked with Jason and others at the YRA and all the wonderful work you guys do in the watershed. Uh, it's far easier for us to tell people what to do than it is for us to do it ourselves. So one of the reasons I came up here was I'm, I'm going to be in a short detail with our facilities folks at Sandpoint. And you know, we own the Sandpoint campus just north of the uh, University of Washington. It's about 100 acres. And I would not take you there to show you that it is a good example of anything green about the shoreline. Uh, you know, it was an old uh, Navy base, as many of you know, and uh, it's full of bulkheads. Uh, there's probably a lot of legacy contaminants in the sediments. A lot of problems. Bottom line is, I'm putting out an all call, all point bulletin. Anybody who wants to help me find ways to green up that shoreline, and that means technical and financial assistance. I'm in the process now of putting a team together of experts to do that very thing. And what I'd like to do is turn the Sandpoint campus into kind of an on-site demonstration of what good BMPs are. You know, like the uh, guidebooks that we worked with the watershed groups on. Um, so that then the public and you can come and you can say, you know, uh, the world didn't come to an end when you put in this particular BNP. Look how that's been working over the last couple of years. Or guess what? You know, you're not going to lose all your beach just because you put a little wood in there. So, Mike Grady, I'll send an email out to the, to the bunch too. But I, I'm really serious about this. Uh, to what extent you're willing to help and then to eventually turn that into a learning lab for green shorelines is really what we're going to do. We're also going to tie it in with treating our stormwater because uh, same issue, you know, we've been successful in working with Federal Highways and WashDOT and SDOT and everybody else, all the dots, um, on how to treat stormwater. Who's from EPA here? Well below your standards. <laughs> uh, to the biological thresholds. Um, and guess what? We don't treat anything coming off our property. And we've got two 42-inch uh, pipes that dump untreated stormwater into Lake Washington which are home to our friends the Puget Sound, Chinook, and Steelhead. Same offer. Uh, I've got a team that I'm putting together to help uh, identify how to do that. Um, I was watching the football game and writing a grant proposal at the same time yesterday. <laughs> Thank God that game was over by the first quarter. Um, <laughs> otherwise, I never would have made my deadline this morning. Um, so anyway, I know there's money, I know there's help out there, and I know there's interest, but more importantly, uh, what we really need, and what I found, you know, being in the city council on Mercer Island, is to find a place where I can take somebody and say, you know what, this is working. And that's what I want to turn the Sandpoint campus into, is a kind of a learning lab for greening up the shoreline and tying that with low impact development processes to treat all the storm. Turn it. Cool. Great. Cool. Thanks for the Very cool. <laughs> Is anybody inspired by those? Why don't we talk? Joe, are you coming up here, Joe? Uh, <laughs> 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 All right. All right, we'll close it up. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Dean, we need the talk for, um, sorry? Okay, thank you. And just again, reminder, that's part of, this is what we're, why we're bringing everybody together. And if you have no other people who can benefit from being part of these conversations, please let them know. If you heard anybody talk that you think is doing something that you're doing, please talk to them. I got crazy last year when I realized I was doing the exact same thing that somebody in San Juan and Kinsap was doing and none of us were talking. 
So that's why we're having these conversations, is so that you can get the feel for what other people are working on, okay? Having said that, okay, so we started this morning with what was going on, and we're looking at the permitting process and trying to peel out from two examples, Lake Washington and um, the San Juans, of what's been going on in the permit process that seems to be broken, and what are some of the suggestions about what can be fixed. Then we wanted to turn to, here's some really interesting ideas that we've heard of, three, the three different examples of the San Juan, uh, Jefferson, uh, Kitsap, Pierce, these are things that are out there that are going on. Do you want to try them? Can you try them? Here's what you can look at from the jurisdiction's perspective. Whenever we talk about the permitting, you also, though, have to come at it from the applicant's perspective. And when you start coming from the applicant's perspective, it gets much, much more complicated, having done it for 20 years of my life, um, that you really are looking at the multiple agencies, the multiple jurisdictions, and it's a whole different communication status, a uh, form of communication. So that's the next thing we want to get at, and we're going to take this from a, a very interesting perspective. So we have two people who are going to come and talk to us who are both applicants, and represent applicants from the consultant side, and talking about what they experience and what they are seeing as some opportunities to, uh, it, to make improvements, and where they see it from their point of view, with their glasses on. So we have Heather Page, from Anchor QEA, and she specializes in managing environmental processes. Uh, um, Sorry. Oops. I've got a soft and, 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 yes. and works with a whole wide range of the permitting from the local, state, federal on a wide range of projects. And her perspective really has been on larger projects, much, much larger, and very complex permitting issues. We also have then Jenny Roston with um, Sea Level Bulkhead Builders, and she's been with that. It's a family operation out of uh, Kingston, 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 and their perspective is the single family and working through the permits. A lot of it on the bulkheads and or bulkhead removals, and so the two of them are going to bring the wealth of their experience working with from the applicant's perspective and working through this permitting process and let us know what they have as some ideas and suggestions for improvements. There's a little tag team effort here. Um, so yeah, the perspective that I'm going to bring, I do work on a number of mega projects. I've worked with some of you in this room. And then Jenny's worked with single family residents, which we don't typically work for. I was going to have a slide in here um, with the Seahawks winning the Super Bowl, but I think somebody stole my thunder earlier on, so I'm glad I didn't include it. You want to go to the next slide? Um, what you can't read here is educating the property owner. I think Jenny and I can both speak to this. That's primarily what we do, and the best way to educate a property owner is to educate ourselves. And I heard earlier about square one, which I thought was brilliant, because I do feel like I, I talk to the city and county codes, um, and I can understand them somewhat, but I usually have to go into the offices to understand them better, talk to um, regulatory agencies in advance to understand it. That's primarily our job, is educating the property owner. Next slide. So on a single family residence basis, it's much smaller and you're working usually with one or two property owners who most likely do not like the government and don't want to be part of the permit process at all. So we come in and help them understand what their, first of all, what their level of need is. So you take an example of an existing old structure that is likely leaching some sort of products into the water and what it's actually protecting. Is it protecting just some vegetation that's growing on their property? Is it protecting their home? Anything that needs a building permit that they can legally protect? Or can we talk to them about what their options are for removing it and re-enhancing their shoreline to be a little bit more of a natural situation? Um, okay. Do the next slide. So this is another example of a level of need. This one was an emergency project where the bulkhead literally fell down in one and this is obvious what the need was. It was an emergency approval from the agencies involved. And 
there's no question. It's much different than the last slide where we can give people an option and a direction for what their permitting requirements are going to be. This one was an approval over the phone. On the side. So uh, this is a, a site visit. Um, I really love that you can't see anything that's happening on these. But <laughs> you can, you can just see <laughs> essentially, what we like to do is go out to the site. What's What are the issues? Because um, I'll be completely honest with you, part of my job is making their lives easier through the permit process. And so we look to see what do you have to do? And what does that mean for the, the actual permits that you're going to need? So what's the purpose and need of your project? Uh, next slide. So this is from the LA Bay Seawall Project. This is the number of permits we needed. And as Laura Arbor can attest to, it's, it's really complicated. Um, when we show our applicants this, they don't want to get permits. <laughs> Go to the next slide. So then we try to break it down a little simpler. Um, what they really care is how long is this going to take me. And to help them figure that out, we do look for exemptions. We do look for programmatics. We look at the nationwide. We look at ways to make their projects fit within those so that it can get through faster. Next slide. So early coordination is key with the property owner, what's your need, what are the permits you're gonna have, and before we even start on the design, we wanna go out to the site with them as well as the agencies. Next slide. So this is an example of an agency meeting that we had just recently where we walked through some concepts. We're thinking of doing this, what do you think? Uh, we'd really like to hear no early um, and start on the process. Meetings, I feel like you can get a lot of input from the stakeholders on what they care about. Next slide. And then we also, as I mentioned, do agency coordination meetings. I know funding is an issue. But I can tell you that going out to the site with the agencies, not just Department of Fish and Wildlife, the Corps, NIFS, U.S. Fish, we can get tribes out there, that's even better. It helps us to understand what your needs are um, so that we can design the projects accordingly because everybody does have conflicting needs. Next. Okay, so you can see this, this project is a, is a soft bank example, but we do the same thing for property owners as we try to go to the local agency and propose that we sit down with all of the agencies that would be permitting the project from an early standpoint before they've gone through any sort of engineering or reports that are required so we can get all of the agencies on board. One example for us is um, a recent discussion is what's the definition of a restoration project? You have a property owner who has an old wood bulkhead there that they don't necessarily need in some areas. Can they remove the portions of that that are no longer functioning and restore that whole section of a beach? Well, one agency says, yes, that's a fantastic idea. I consider that restoration. And the other agency says, well, that's still an armoring project, so it still has to go through a permit appro approval. Getting everybody on the same page with at least what their definitions of that type of project are would be very helpful from the beginning stages rather than having to go back through the process of engineering or design work and rehiring professionals to rewrite or report because they need to be specific to the type of design we're proposing. And so one of the things that we found really works is the pre-application meetings of the core. They have them, I know, uh, once a month. But for the single family residents that may not be applicable, we definitely do that on larger scale projects. In those meetings, we have all the agencies in there. We can talk about what our conceptual design is, uh, what our proposed mitigation would be, and what do we need to have in our application to make sure we're moving ahead. Uh, Pre-application meetings with the city and county really helps us to understand your code. I think the code is, um, in some cases, easy to understand, and in other cases, it's, it's not. It's a little convoluted. And the city of Seattle, I think, has done a really good job to have these tips um, to help us applicants figure out what to do. They have a really robust um, applicant service center that you can walk in, you can do, what Pierce County is doing where you type in a question. Those kinds of things are really helpful for us, but also for the applicants, because it, it does feel a bit onerous on that side. Next slide. Next slide, so which studies do you need? This is a stream survey. Um, I can tell you I've been on projects where we submitted applications and then heard later, you know, I really needed to know about what the, what the stream survey said or what did, what kind of habitat was underneath there. Based off of me going down the process and getting it wrong the first time, I learned to find out a little bit more in advance the next time. 
but not everybody um, homeowners are going to have that kind of perspective. So this is an example of a stream survey to understand what what do the cities and counties need to have in their code if we have to do a critical areas report, for example. Next slide. We've also had to do invasive plants uh, surveys, wetland surveys. Next slide. This is the LA based snorkel survey. Next slide. Um, and the eelgrass survey. So this costs a lot of money uh, for the applicants. And so I'd say a large scale project, something like this is definitely feasible. Um, one thing that might be helpful is if we could provide those studies to city, county, state, so that you can give it to other applicants to be able to use if you have projects in that same area. Because not everybody can afford studies like this, but for those who can, people can learn from us. Next slide. One more example for a um, more biological study that's involved a lot more now for single family residences that some of you may be a little familiar with is uh, meeting the floodplain development requirements for the permitting through FEMA. And most counties do not know what that report needs to say, in my experience. And having what Mike described for the reporting for biological evaluations would be so helpful. It, it could be very easy to understand what needs to be in the report and the process of how it's going to be reviewed from multiple agencies. Because usually when those are, reports are provided, they're provided to more than one agency. So having there be one report that can hit everybody's points would be very helpful for most property owners because you're not paying to have something done twice or in just two different formats. So um, that is an example. Plus the archeological surveys that are required for a lot of property owners um, when the tribe does get involved and request those. Um, there's not a lot of feedback from from them on a lot of projects, but when they do require this type of work, it's not it's clear for the property owner why they need it, or that something even is nearby, or what the monitoring plan includes. Can they hire somebody to do the monitoring? Does the tribe provide that? So having a little bit more of a um, understanding from the permit process at the beginning for what that permit and that um, survey needs to be including. Next slide. Uh, mitigation ideas, I know we have a uh, presentation on that, so I'm really curious personally to hear that. Um, next slide, so we'll just touch on a few things. We, we first look at ways to avoid and minimize. I think mitigation is a, a key question for a lot of applicants. It's probably the first question I get when I'm working on a project. Next slide. Uh, that was eelgrass, this is revegetation ideas. Um, one of the things that we try to look at is what can their site Accommodate. A lot of times their site cannot accommodate some type of mitigation for their impacts that are unavoidable. Uh, we do, again, try to avoid and minimize them to the extent possible. Next slide. On most single family residence projects, they don't have enough square footage on their property to provide as much mitigation as may be needed. You know, uh, even if it's a one to one footprint, four to one, whatever the agencies are requiring. Um, we've talked a lot with some um, local jurisdictions about not just starting with beach nourishment and revegetation, but as um, it was described from NOAA, what is their stormwater doing on their property? How does it come down their bank? Is it also causing problems on their, on their bank? Is it disposing anything from their driveway runoff onto their beach? Um, looking at mitigation for what's just available on that piece of property, because they don't have usually very many square feet to work with to offer the mitigation. So getting a little creative with what we've come up with from the beginning with the agencies of who's going to want what and what thresholds we're trying to meet. Next slide. Um, along those lines, I have to be honest, King County Only Fee Program has been very good, and it would be nice to see some of that um, incorporated in other areas too, because I know Only Fee is one of the core um, guidance in the 2008 mitigation rule. Next slide. I was, uh, this is collaborative working with tribe. Those really glad to see that Daryl Williams was able to come here and speak. Um, I can tell you from an applicant perspective, it feels um, it's very government to government focused. And then we have a hard time understanding how can we work with the tribes versus submitting our applications and then hearing afterwards what would work. On mega projects, we are able to do a lot of work with the tribes in advance. For example, we've had meetings with National Marine Fisheries Service and US Fish and Wildlife Service to go over step by step um, our biological assessment for endangered species act and we invited Suquamish and Muckleshoot tribe to attend those meetings. We were able to get feedback. They even gave us some design ideas. And I think that really helped us moving through that process. 
We also do uh, pre-surveys, so having them look at our, what do we plan on doing for archeological investigations, that they can provide input so we don't have to go back and do it again. Uh, next slide, that's a geotech example. This is Suquamish Tribe. Um, we did have an opportunity to work with them on a dock project, and you can see that um, the dock is on the, and the replacement one is up on the top. I think it, this was a really good example of understanding the tribe's wants and needs for fishing. I don't think I really understood that until I worked with the tribes. Next slide. And this is an example, this actually isn't a single family residence project, this is actually um, a, a project down in Olympia on the Mission Creek Restoration. The tribes were very concerned about finding evidence of any sort of artifacts there, so they actually had their archaeologists on site working with us while we were excavating the material. So we, we worked with them on the project to, to make sure we were working toward their goals. If, if there was something there, which they really thought that there might be, there wasn't. But they, their goals and their concerns were definitely part of the project and built into the permitting from the very beginning. And it was, it was just a group effort of making sure that their concerns were met. Just along those lines, I, I know we talked about, there was a question asked about, so we work federal to federal with tribes. Is there a way to bring it to the city and the county? And I don't, I don't know if there's an answer to that, but that's one that um, I'd like to understand as well um, as we think about different ways to improve the process. Next slide. Monitoring and compliance. Next slide. So what we wanted to really focus on for monitoring and compliance is really just our, our ideas from applicant standpoints of how, how this can be monitored. I know that there are long-term contracts our property owners that we've worked with have done from on the state level with Fish and Wildlife, which is great. That follows the property, but there's not a really easy way for fish to be reminded of, oh hey, their, their nourishment was due five months ago, they need to do at least so many yards of nourishment on their beach by this date, but they also have to follow within the work windows. Same thing on the county level. Um, one idea I had was, it used to be, um, if your permit was expiring soon, you as a property owner would get a little notice in the mail and say, hey, you haven't had any activity on your building permit, are you going to do something? It's closing. Something in the system that also reminds not just the property owner, but whoever is sitting at the planning desk. Most of the time it's not going to be the same planner in five years. That this nourishment or the or the vegetation needs to be checked. You need to submit your photos. There needs to be some sort of just embracing technology and using what we were talking about earlier with Pierce County's online permitting, if that somehow can be incorporated so that there's just this automated thing that comes through and saying, hey, you need to do this on your permit. Hey, you need to do this on your permit. Um, that might be the easiest way to make sure that these things are actually being done. We get called randomly when people need more beach nourishment on their beach, but it's you know it's a lot of work for any one person to just keep it in their system and, and track. And a lot of property owners don't need a lot. They don't need a contractor to come through the barge and put a bunch of nourishment on the beach. They just might need a, you know 20 yards or so that they can have some neighbor kids help them with or something. But there still needs to be some some sort of tracking system built into their permitting to make it easier for them to actually comply. And what we do from the applicant standpoint is when we get a permit and it says you have to monitor every five years, I'll put it in my calendar to help the client. But for the single family homeowners, they don't typically have um, a consultant on board to do that sometimes. So it's a matter of educating them to allow them to be aware of how to track it for themselves is an idea too. Next slide. It's just another example. Yeah, this is just another example of a you know already installed bulkhead that did have a mitigation plan in, in place, and wondering whether or not the current owners are following that mitigation plan is, is unknown. Most of the time, if there's a um, a deed on the property that's filed, that could be disclosed during the property sailing. Um, but another idea is if um, you know in Kitsap County, I know there's there's monitoring covenants that are required for certain types of permits. Um, but, but then again, you need to be able to make sure that the people are actually following those because just written on paper, who's going to actually enforce it? Um, so definitely sending out some sort of tracking system for everybody to be on the same page. So it seems we may have a little bit of time for questions. Any questions, thoughts, considerations? Okay. Well, oh, looks like we got one in the back here. And I got one. Um, um, so it's a thought about working with the tribe and of course the fish uh, report work and we developed a cultural resource protection management plan. 
is kind of more um, course practice application centered, but it's got a lot of really good uh, generic kind of uh, ideas on how to work with the tribes. It's always talk to them early. Um, usually with the shoreline stuff, I would consider uh, you want to talk to their natural resources and fisheries department, let them know what's going on. They can then review it for their cultural artifacts or known places of importance, which um, we on the outside of the reservations do not know about. They keep those very close to the best. Um, the United State agencies don't know about those. So they'd like to be told. Usually they'll just say, no, we're good. Go ahead, go for the conquer. But um, they generally want to be consulted early and have the opportunity. And there, so it's knowing who, which tribe you're affecting, which um, UNA you're in, usual and custom area you're in. Can you repeat that? I wish I could repeat that back. That was really good. Um, I, what I what I hear is basically the early coordination, and you mentioned that you had what was it for? Um, oh, the document. Yeah. Um, it's on the natural resources site. It's the Cultural Resource Protection and Management Plan. Okay, Department of Natural Resources Cultural Resources Assessment and Protection Plan. Cultural Resources Management and Protection. Yeah, we call Management it Protection. protection. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that's good. I mean, I feel like from an applicant, um, tribes don't want to talk to me. Um, and, and I'm saying that, honestly, they, they really do want to talk to government to government. And I think we rely a lot on city, DNR, WFW, and the core. And I'm wondering if that guidance is speaking more to the, the government aspect, no. or how, do, how does an applicant get into doing something like that as well? Um, so you would call and I think anybody can just call their natural resources department and say, I'm a consultant, I have a client who's going to be looking at doing some near shore alterations. It's in your UNA area. Do you have any advice to you? I talk to or we don't want to, we want your input on cultural resource and fisheries impacts. And then leave it up to them to forward it on. And then you've done your due diligence. But the, the crump is kind of geared towards the small forest landowner. So individual, in your case, would be the individual So um, what I'm hearing is that uh, it is up to doing our due diligence to call the tribes. There are um, opportunities to call their fisheries, ask them, look, I'm doing a project here. You may have interest. Can you help provide us some guidance? And at least you're doing your due diligence up in advance. And Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission is a wonderful resource to know who you can talk to. Okay, Northwest Indian Fisheries Resource, okay. Yes? A question for you. Yeah. Um, do you actually do the bulkhead constructions or is the company permit consulting? We do okay. everything. Can you, you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Uh, the question was do we actually do the construction or do we just consult for permitting? We do everything in house. We, just, we start from the, the ground up, so we help them design it, come up with what their ideas are, their needs, tell them, and hopefully have enough education from all your jurisdictions of what kind of reports they will need and what kind of costs they're looking at, time frame and everything, and then we actually construct what the agencies all end up agreeing on for the And so, uh, second question, have you had training in the soft shore protection techniques? We have not had training. We've worked with about a handful of different geotechnical engineers and structural engineers to come up with designs. Um, we've been working with local governments and Fish and Wildlife very closely on coming up with examples of, and just practicing to see what works and going back and monitoring and seeing, okay, let's see how that project functioned. Did we do a good job? Did, is this working how we all thought it was? Um, so we work really closely with all the agencies and engineers involved that, and, and the biologists as well to see, make sure we're meeting everybody's concerns, but that it's also functioning how everybody thought it was going to function in the environment. That's great because it's cutting edge technology. Great to hear from somebody that's actually doing it on the ground. Yeah, and there's a lot of ideas and designs out there. So, I mean, it's a, it's a very vast green bulkhead, whatever you want to call it. Um, and there's a lot of money out there for people to take out the hard armor bulkheads and put in something a little softer. It's just a matter of looking through the requirements for different codes just to make sure we're following what the agency. So the question was, if we have to go back and repair something because it was a poor and get another biological um, assessment, and so far no, we haven't had to get another one. Um, it usually is just a learning lesson of some, some design function.
things that may not have been appropriate or even from the applicant or the property owner or the agencies or the geotech. Um, it doesn't really matter. We usually just fix what's wrong. Um, in one case, there was a soft bank design that we, just, we were working on actually the slide on Bainbridge, and one of the anchors popped and the log came fixing what happened because of storm activity. So I, I, you got a bulkhead here, your neighbor has one, it's just a continuous bulkhead in many cases, and I'm curious about... Okay, so the question was, is if we get a call from a property owner who's willing to remove their bulkhead and do something more natural, what the resistance has been from neighbors, very strong, very strong. Properties. Um, and, and usually we can come up with, with the engineering, we can come up with a way to, you know, extend their wing wall back a little bit, maybe on that, on the property. and risk assessment, biodiversity surveys, ecological risk assessments, environmental remediation, and habitat restoration. And as branch chief, Dr. Fisher oversees Endangered Species Act consultation of Lower Columbia staff and provides technical assistance to a wide range of issues population recovery. And Jeff is going to talk about the habitat equivalent. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, like my colleague Mike, uh, I have a revelation about NOAA. Uh, in the time that I've been there, we've had a higher. I'm going to rely on you to, uh, to, to move the slides. Okay. Just a shout out to our application to the Puget Sound Air Shore. I'm just going to real slide it, and if we have answers, if not, we can cover those in the discussion. So we set on uh, using uh, habitat equivalency analysis uh, in part because NOAA's had a lot of cases where primarily the injury is associated with, uh, for which we've identified an, a, a, an injury to, uh, to a resource, be it uh, flatfish, such as in Commencement Bay. Habitat equivalency analysis is basically determining the amount of restoration needed to achieve that ecological equivalency over time. The restoration is essentially scaled to the injury, taking into account the time it takes to get lost. Next slide. So given that, there's an inherent assumption in, in our use of here, and that is that there's uh, that the public value of the service at the landscape scale is really independent. That's kind of a, a wordy way of saying that the functions that are lost or are analyzed to be lost from an activity, they cannot be so inherently limited that essentially the same broad example you wanted to use here to evaluate what type of level of restoration we would you require for some where an incremental loss of that bit of habitat uh, simply could not be or, or could not be compensated an equivalent amount of restoration at that, that landscape scale. In section seven speak, the way I, I like to look at that is, is that in essence, if we analyze a project and we determine that this project jeopardy, we wouldn't apply an adverse effect, um, and yet we believe we can offset that adverse effect. Next slide. You understand what that nature of the service damaged is and that and the nature of the service that needs to be <clears throat> and uh, the degree of the area uh, to which that, that service and there needs to be a consistent metric metric 
applied for the quantity and the quality of the service that is both injured and restored. Next slide. Um, under our guidance, uh, in particular, you know, you're trying to avoid and minimize the effects of the action. That's very consistent, I think, with both local and state codes. But avoidance and minimization in and of themselves uh, do, not, do not equate necessarily to the fact that there isn't a habitat loss. There aren't functional loss. Uh, there is not a functional loss to habitat. Minimizing, but especially with the permanent development actions, which is the, what we're applying this model to, there can still be a deficit in the habitat function that remains. So the last it's built, it is there. So all of the long-term effects address those effects, those permanent effects from permanent and near shore habitat values are plugged into the equation. Two points, FIA and near shore habitat values. They both are required. Essentially the summary of the, of the HIA calculation the math of my talk, and this is breathe easy. Essentially, you're looking at the sum over time of the value of the habitat. This is habitat service gain. I can have a oracle approach where we have a small polygon of an area of an impact. And we have a list of categories of values based upon the species that we interpret to be injured and the value of that within the polygon to support that. My, uh, the year recouped and the time when the impact occurs usually that's time zero the bulkhead or a pure empty flow and then the discount rate we use a three percent standard discount rate i'm not an economist but essentially what that's telling us is what we can get this more today than we would value at that same service tomorrow okay so that is the uh the, the dsa value at the end of the day next slide excuse me, the number of years it will take area affected to reach full function, and uh, the number of years that the restoration site would be present. Um, so that, that fourth bullet there, essentially, this is both the time for restoration that's assumed to apply, as well as the time of the injury. And in, in our case, we're assuming 300 years. Uh, on the left side, uh, uh, an example of a cumulative uh, DSA uh, of a service that, that reaches full function in 20 years, within about the first, most of it's 80, 90 percent of it's happening within the first 20 years, and then it slowly, slowly slopes down out, and simply a, a cumulative uh, expression of that same information on the left hand side, determined consistently. And so when we started to, to work on this, this was one of my bugaboos, is that uh, having seen also sat on some impacts, we wanted something that was more transparent, more consistent over time, and uh, it's something that we could communicate to the public, uh, the rationale behind our known of, of assigning a, a value between zero and one for uh, the, the habitat polygon, and then the evaluation matrix. Next summary of how it looked in the catalog. The forage, migration, uh, refuge, uh, didn't make it up on that slide. It's at the Puget Sound Chinook Salmon in the Puget Sound near shore, extending to the depth of uh, maximum depth of critical habitat of minus 30 meters. We'll just go on the next slide because I'm running out of time. Just the graphic. So we have four zones that we're evaluating when we use this model in, in the near shore. In the green zone, the upper shore zone, which extends down to plus five mean low, low water, essentially trying to capture impacts of a problem. Lower shore zone, which basically captures the primary zone where we see impactation and eel growth. That last example I basically showed you showed a upper shore zone, 40 feet, and a bunch of pilings. Next slide. That's kind of an example of the output of just one of the spreadsheets that we have in our model. And in this case, I just wanted to point your attention to the fact that there's a no, this, this factor would be just a one. So in other words, this is going to jack you're in. Uh, one of these areas, one of these crediting or discounting for sure, within five miles of the major estuary, which literature shows us are being used by uh, juvenile Chinook. Get a negative value on the end. I think I only have one or two more slides. And then day, this is what we're going to have to offset in terms of the positive amount of restoration needed. Next slide. So at this point, we used it and scaled it to, to about eight different projects. We use it on about 20 different consultations. It's not uh, DFW. 
and, and others just to try to get some feedback and refine them all over the time over time and obviously of course particularly for peer regional general permit six. Uh, that's it. Cool. Thank you. And then um, at 20 after we get sharp, we get started because we have a lot of good talks to come.
legitimate <laughs> erosion issue. Next slide. Um, this is just on the beach looking down. I think the little cabin is just off to the right. But again, you can see there's some erosion happening. Um, there's some riparian plantings in here. There, this is obviously, this one's in January, so it's a little brown, but um, there was some scotch broom issues. There were some blackberry issues, but there's, there was erosion. Next slide. Fifty 
the 200 permits. Um, 
Yes and no. I mean, there's no... Also gives up to up to six feet if needed for conditions or whatever. You know, certainly the last project with South Beach. But again, a lot of these projects
There it is. Very pleased to introduce Jose, who's a principal with Herrera. I told you it wasn't about that.
time this
say for habitat reasons, or just is something that was required and we just added in the wood for beautification purposes. The same thing applies uh, about vegetation. Uh, just like Chris mentioned, uh, vegetation along the shoreline can be an issue in terms of view. So what is really the purpose? Is that serving a purpose such as
In terms of how we go about doing this from the scientific perspective, I just wanted to say that there are a number of models that have been created. This is one from size Samstad.
you can Better.
Uh, yeah, my, my role in King County, my name is Michael Murphy, but everybody calls me Murphy. If I've worked, you know that. Um, my role at King County has three parts. I manage the county's fee and lieu mitigation program, or in lieu fee mitigation program. conservation planning at the county landscape scale and working on uh, department and executive level um, initiatives in that, that regard. So um, here I am. Let's go to the first slide. I always start my presentations off the same first two slides. Uh, this as a reminder of
So, on-site mitigation if possible, and then look at off-site mitigation options. Again, the, um, the banks, if there's a mitigation bank serving Uh, 
necessarily monitoring mitigation sites. We've got the expertise to do that. throughout the landscape. Um, and that phone number, I have if uh, a card to follow up with you. So, so you have time for one question. The, the, question, the question is regarding the uh, sort of importance and the, the type of projects that come to projects for the 520 replacement and I think that a lot of people would say that was a project. It's all of the above. Right. Well, no, go ahead. Yeah.
it gets time to meeting a mitigation. Right up front, and from implement, you know, inspection, uh, uh, design, construction, maintenance, monitor, reporting, long term stewardship, site protection. You think you can name it? We have to cover it with that one fee we collect up front. Wow. So it's clear from the presentations and the discussions today
Anybody else? Who'd like to go next? This is the first one of these I've attended, so maybe it's happened in other places, but uh, or in, in other versions of the same forum. But I was shocked when I got here today about the underrepresentation from the regulated community. I thought that Heather and Jenny did a nice job of representing some of those viewpoints, but um, my question is, where are the developers in this conversation, and, and how can we fold them in without? But I also feel like that's maybe what we all need to hear at times. And I think that there could be some really innovative ideas coming out of the development community. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
those as well about permitting. broaden the circle of who needs to be involved in the conversations. I think that we have involved in shoreline permitting, shoreline planning, helps a lot. Uh, the same thing has Thank <laughs> you. 
biological assessment that means everybody has made. So we're preparing several different reports. So I think that helps a lot. And I noticed that um, the legislation that gets through is mostly for mega projects. Washa has permit streamlining type of legislation that gets through, but I don't see it on a smaller scale. I think it's starting to develop. While I'm walking over, I think it's over here. Oh. There. Oh. Joe, right you. No, Joe, Joe, right in front of you, and then, and then the rest of I'll keep my uh, brief. I agree with the previous uh, suggestions, but I think um, a regional approach would be very helpful to help put some context. So my thought is uh, all the agencies currently assume that the existing shoreline armory can be maintained
requires people to actually mitigate the impacts they cause, including the impacts of maintaining or replacing existing arm and shoreline that would otherwise be destroyed by letting nature take its course. So it seems like if people have to justify and pay for the impacts they cause, there will be some strong incentive to minimize the impacts of these kinds of activities. And that's not I just follow up on that one, and this might be a Noah Hia question. I was looking at a project recently that would involve replacing a bulkhead with a new
understand, correct me if I'm wrong, the issue is that the local jurisdiction doesn't understand the process for the HBA and the core permit, and they don't understand how those sync up. Is that the issue? And FEMA.
it really worked well. It may have been a one-off, may have been unique to that circumstance, but there may be lesson learned. So I'm going to throw three ideas out, and then you guys can react, because I don't know if these are good or bad ideas. Um, the first one is, and I think this kind of riffs off what Heather was saying, but I wasn't in the room when you said it, so I'm not sure. But an actual one-stop, actual physical shop for permits. In other words, all your
Permits, permits derive from the legislative uh, action that the council takes, and so every community is somewhat different. that they could be lined up, but the effort to do that would be so overwhelming because in each jurisdiction
I would echo what Michael said, the JARP form actually as an applicant would be easier to do or if you would adopt it locally, we're doing it anyway for the feds and the state process. So why require another application if the information is in the drug form? So is the other go to see barriers to doing that? Over here, uh, I mean, uh, well, raise your hand again. It's just sort of an uh, addition to what I had said earlier about working in Oregon compared to Washington. Mm -hmm. And essentially, um, they're all their permits.
local jurisdiction of their own farm.
One thing that we overlook, I think, is that uh, high quality, high quality staff come at a cost, and we, as local governments, don't.
and family education piece, because I've been talking to different partners from conservation districts to uh, ecology to the planning department, and the piece that I'm finding that got cut with all the cuts in budgets was education for staff across the board, almost everywhere. people are Uh, you mentioned about a, a, like a regional permit clearinghouse, and I think that's a, a
much, and don't forget to leave your sheets behind. So, um, one quick thing. So, so, thank you all very, very much for coming. Wait, 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 wait. Well, so uh, because this is grant funded, we will be sending you guys an, a survey monkey tomorrow morning. And if you wouldn't mind taking five minutes, two minutes, really
do. If that's something you're interested in or you're confused about, please see each other or me, and we will dial you into trying to put this together. There's a group that's started talking about how to make that happen and Thank you.